Okay, folks, it is 631 and we have everybody here. So I will call our meeting to order. Um, and welcome, uh, Councillor Cohn, and ask you to introduce yourself. Helen Cohn, District 2. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'll go over a few uh, meeting logistics. Any, anyone who's participating remotely, I would ask you to change your name display on the screen to your first and last name so that we know who we're talking and listening to. Um, I would, uh, anyone who wants to address the council, we would, one, you do need to be uh, recognized by the chair. Two, we would ask you to start by uh, stating your name and telling us where you live. We ask everybody to keep your comments and questions to under three minutes. Um, and if you're speaking out about a particular agenda item, we would ask you to keep your comments germane to the uh, topic at hand. And if you stray from the topic or go over time, we will uh, remind you that uh, of the expectations. Um, with that, uh, we'll move to approve the agenda. Is, are there any uh, requested changes to the agenda? Okay, we'll consider the agenda approved. Next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. As with uh, other um, other items involving addressing the council, we ask you to identify yourself by name and where you live and uh, and limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anyone? Yes. Well, why don't you step up to the microphones? My name is Regina Liberzi and I live on Berlin Street in Montpelier. I was curious. I don't know the name of the road. Maybe it's Fisher Road, but it's the one that continues up Berlin Street to the exit seven and it's been it was closed like at least for a year before the flood i don't know if you talk about this or where is a good time or a well, place to discuss it i I'm could just... tell you that is fisher road right i don't think it's official but that's in Ber in the town of berlin oh it's not here and it's so thank you it, it's on them it's not on us thank you <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name's uh, Deputy Chief Joe Walzer of uh, the Barry City Fire Department. I'm also the chairman of the uh, Vermont D EMS District 6. And uh, I was wondering if I could have Lieutenant Larrabee please uh, come join us at the podium. Um, I'm here tonight. Uh, each year, Vermont EMS District presents uh, the Virginia Caffin Award to an EMS provider in the district that best embodies the spirit of the Virginia Caffin. Uh, Virginia was instrumental in the EMS, uh, modernization of EMS and EMS education in uh, central Vermont. Virginia and her husband uh, founded Cabot Ambulance this year, uh, Cabot Ambulance. This year, I'm pleased to announce that Lieutenant Jacob Larrabee has been awarded uh, 2023 Virginia Caffin Award. Jake has been a big part of emergency medical services and in this community and uh, in central Vermont during almost his two decades of service. His nomination letter spells it out how well deserving Jake and his commitment to his patients and the city of Montpelier. Lieutenant Larrabee continues to, uh, to mentor his staff to uh, strive to provide the best patient care he can. Lieutenant Larrabee has stepped forward and become one of the lead instructors to continue the implementation of the crisis intervention team uh, training here in Central Vermont. I'm honored and excited to say that he has been able to uh, bridge the gap and foster uh, continued conversations and teamwork between EMS providers, police officers, and mental health clinicians, and continues to remove the mystery of what each can bring to the table and to learn from each other on how we can streamline and maximize each contact with a uh, person in crisis. Please, I'm gonna read the nomination letter. Uh, that pretty much says it in a, a nutshell. Please accept my request to nominate Jake Larrabee of the Montpelier Fire Department for the receipt of the Virginia Caffin Award. Jake Larrabee grew up in Montpelier area and graduated from Montpelier High School 
Jake has been with the Montpelier Fire Department for a total of 23 years, with 21 of those being full-time. Jake has been a lieutenant for Montpelier Fire Department for approximately 20 years. Jake is currently an EMS certified as a Vermont EMT and national level EMT. Jake has held and worked in many roles throughout his career and continues to advance his knowledge on a daily basis. Jake has been the local union president working for the professional firefighters to obtain advances and protections firefighter and EMS workers in Vermont to include things like cancer presumption. Jake has been in a uh, child care seat installation technician. He currently is an active instructor for the Montpelier area and the field of CIT, crisis intervention team. He recently participated in the uh, training of active threat integrated response course, school mass casualty events. Jake is also a member of the Professional Firefighters of Vermont peer support team. This team is a phone call answering for a firefighter EMS that may be experiencing a crisis and need of uh, peer talk and assist them in getting services that help they need. Before working in the fire and EMS field, Jake had worked for Washington County Mental Health. He is a husband and father of three sons, and he is actively participates in helping and cheering on their sports team members. Jake is also the, this year has become a certified referee for high school level basketball. Jake is a definition of public service. He continues to actively work on the ambulance, taking calls, and his compassion and care with the patients is above and beyond. He is a mentor for uh, two new members joining the department and is how to treat and interact with patients. He also works uh, part-time during his limited free time with the East Montpelier Ambulance, as well, again, I ask for consideration for Jake Larrabee to be a junior captain award. said there was something happening at the meeting and he needed uh he needed um the, a few people from the union executive board to be there well played um, <laughs> i don't do um praise very well but thank you I, this is a great honor um uh yeah and i'm, I'm happy that i'm found a job and a career that I enjoy and I can make an impact and and uh, I'm looking forward to where our fire department can go with new leadership and thanks for the support. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I'll mention before my clock starts that when I approach them about providing some training to folks at shelters or who deal with people on the street for to administer Narcan and to deal with drug overdose emergencies, he was right there with offers and suggestions and and it was commendable. That's great. Um, I want to raise a couple of things starting uh the and one is is a consequence of deferred maintenance uh we've had turnover over the years and public works directors and so this mistake very expensive and time consuming mistake on school street of not knowing where what part pipes are charged finding new pipes that nobody knew where they went or where they went and, and cutting into a live pipe and then nobody knowing where to find the valve to turn it off. It's estimated by some experts that this has cost us 20 grand in the last 24 hours, you know? And it's that's unexcusable. It's it's really knowing testing, even if we have to do some carefully timed outages in order to establish the bounds of which valves control what, that that's long overdue. Uh, how many more times will this happen and under less favorable conditions? Um, this one was easy to fix, but it delayed uh, getting off of school street before 
the school open. Uh, I want to raise an issue about the Elks. Oh, Elks Club problems, which were given lip service and a lot of uh, critique of the council's action or lack thereof uh, at the, your last meeting, uh, seems to have fallen off of urgency. It's not on the agenda tonight. And I've written to the council and said, you know, assigning it to the task force that's had five years to do it. We articulated that that charge five years ago and they haven't done it. So now saying do it in 30 days, especially with the current makeup of the task force is just gonna, is, is it, we're, we'll be 30 days closer into winter with still nothing. So I think this council needs to add it to the agenda under other business and, and wrestle with this issue. How are we gonna get a plan and with what scope and breadth and management team uh, Good Sam's the first to admit that they cannot handle all of Montpelier's needs, and Montpelier has neglected to build capacity uh, to meet the difference. It, I've told you there's 60 people out, you know, already, and another 60 or more being ejected from hotels. And Good Sam's proposal said they were going to house 20. You know, uh, so you got a problem there. Country. Well, Thank you, Steve. I... Anybody else in the room who likes to like to address us under general business and appearances? And I do not see up oh, Dee Dee Brush. I'm sorry for not knowing this ahead of time. And uh, the Confluence Park is on your agenda. Is that when I would address the council with yes. the Confluence Park? Park yes, thoughts? exactly. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we can move to the consent agenda. Um, one of the items on the consent agenda is uh, is is minutes and a parliamentary issue related to the minutes from June twenty eighth, two thousand twenty three, and we are going to pull that off the agenda for tonight. Um, move it to our next meeting to give us time to do some uh, research before we. Uh, take action on it. Um, with that, is uh, is there a motion on the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Next up, re appointments to the Homelessness Task Force and the Complete Streets Committee. And I believe we have uh, the same person uh, applying uh, for both of those. Nolan, thanks for coming in. Um, do you want to step up and just introduce yourself to the council? I know you've been here before, but. Thank you, Mayor. Allow me to introduce myself again. My name's Nolan Carver. I reside in Ward 1, the Hubbard Meadows neighborhood with my mother and a special needs man on Winter Street. Um, I've been um, in the process of recovery in the, over the last few years, and I've been making great strides and bounds, uh, thanks in part to the opportunity to serve on the Conservation Commission. It's been over a year, and we've seen two floods, and what a great uh, time to get involved. Uh, we're in this homelessness pandemic and a heroin pandemic, and the streets are, as Steve mentioned, uh, changing as well. And so I'm just looking to sort of get involved more and sort of see where I can um, help find these uh, dynamic solutions uh, for these uh, very uh, interesting times. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I always appreciate the efforts that people put into as volunteers on our boards and commissions. Is there a motion? I move we appoint Nolan Carver to the Homelessness Task Force and the Complete Streets Committee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. More. I, I hope you have the energy to do all, all of this. Yeah. 
Item eight, uh, FEMA process overview from Guidehouse. Um, I'll try to adjust the volume a little bit here for you. Um, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. I'm here with Thad Lugamores, who um, is a Guidehouse um, representative. He works with the state um, for FEMA Consulting and VEM, um, Vermont Emergency Management. I'm going to just tee things up for you and provide a brief introduction of where we are currently. Um, with recovery from the July 2023 event. Um, and then Thad is going to take some questions from you related to um, the process and where we're going. Um, so what I prepared is just a couple of brief talking points that I wanted to kind of get in front of you so you could kind of be thinking about where we are. So um, the damaged inventory list that we submitted to FEMA has 44 projects. Of those 44 projects, 15 have been submitted for obligation um, and funding. Um, so we, we are getting funds from those. We have received 135,000 or so, so far of those 15 projects there, they total about $910,000. And so that's just to kind of give you a um, scale of order of magnitude in terms of where we are with projects and what's been funded so far. The total project list, those 44 projects is about $11 million. Um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of get in front of you is where we stand with the um, fund split. So the federal, state, local cost share. It is likely that we will be getting notice that um, we will be going to a 90-10 fund split. We have not officially received that notice. So at this point, it's a 25-75. So federal, 25, state, or local. Um, and so, you know, that how that breaks down is we've got the... 75%, which is the federal share, um, and that comes to about 800 or 8.3 million. Um, and then from there, we get into the state and local share. And so the ERAF funding coming from the state is about 17.5% that we'll be getting. Um, and so that breaks down to about 1.9 million. And then the balance is about a million dollars or so is what we'd be on the hook for if we were at the 7.5%. It's likely that that'll be um, decrease based on the federal share. But even if we came in at say 3%, we'd be at $330,000 on our local share. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the size and scale of what we're dealing with for, you know, our share of recovery. Um, and then just a bit about where we are. Um, so the projects that I noted are really preventative emergency services that we've been reimbursed for so far. There are some projects that are on the smaller end of things, such as like parking meters and trash receptacles. Um, and so there's still a lot to come our way, but it's been sort of a trickle. Um, so as you recall, it's about 135,000 that we've received. Um, so we're still working on that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of note is we brought in June um, an amendment to the Stevens and Associates contract, um, which is teeing us up to get um, to the next phase of the project. Um, we have completed the programmatic study of this building, um, and we'll be starting to move on to the schematic review, which will then provide us with um, just the real costs of what it'll cost to replace items within the buildings, which is the largest pot, part of that $11 million project that figure that we've got for all the projects. Um, and then the other thing that I want to note is that we are on the clock um, for permanent projects. There's an 18-month window from the date of um, the event. Um, so that would put us at January 10th. So what we're doing is we're kind of marching towards that deadline with the Stevens and Associates work so that we can be ready to move ahead um, and likely seeking um, an alternative procedures project, which would be based on cost estimates for reimbursement. So I know that's a lot. I'm happy to provide these talking points by email so that you have them, but I just wanted to kind of tee up Kind of the lay of the land where we are today, um, and then have Thad get into kind of the program overview and where we're going. So I'm going to hand it over right now. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, yeah, hello again. My name is Thad Liga Morris. I uh, here I technically work for Vermont, Vermont Emergency Management. I'm kind of a free agent in this world at this point. I've been doing it almost 20 years. 
I was here for Irene. Um, I worked for the state of Massachusetts under the Baker administration for four years. And then when this event occurred, unfortunately, uh, it was sort of a no brainer to come back and help the state um, and be part of the guide house team. So uh, I've been doing this a long time and, um, you know, I appreciate what you guys are going through. Uh, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, part of my role here is helping, you know, key applicants in the state, you know, and the team that you have here, you know, in Zach and Sarah and Kelly have been like our top in the state and working with FEMA, being prepared, and frankly, you know, standing their grounds where they need to and, and being part of the process and really taking control. So, uh, you know, you're in good hands there. Um, they got on everything early. Um, you know, we were there giving advice, but but they took it. Um, and, and my experience really with this world of that you're about to get into with these key buildings started in Waterbury with the Waterbury State Office Complex that we mitigated and, and you know, did the things that you now see, which is totally change it and reuse it and repurpose it. Um, so the way that this program works as it relates to these buildings is, you know, the PA grant is different than any other grant that you really have. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a joke here, but it's true, right? PA is the only grant where you know, it's Tuesday, you went to sleep and it was raining. Wednesday, you woke up and you had grants that you never wanted, right? That's how PA works. And you're eligible for those repairs and mitigation and other things, as long as you can document that you're eligible, right? It's not like where there's a finite amount of money, like other grants work, and you just apply and they cut it off, right? So- And ju just to clarify for people who don't live with this every day, PA is public assistance. Public, theme of public assistance. That's okay. for- uh, assistance to municipalities yeah basically ensure i should rewrite i should back up public assistance program is the that's what we we uh that's the program that funds all uninsured municipal losses based on categories of work right your emergency work your debris your police and fire overtime then your permanent repairs in these different categories the one i'm talking about is category e which happens to be buildings which is your key category here right so sorry you're right i should have slowed down there a bit but the way the grant works is once you have a declared disaster, you know, and there's a whole menu for how that works, you're going to get the next one here in a few days, right? But once that occurs, you're eligible for those things. So by nature, the program is designed to go out and carefully document all that, right, to make sure you are eligible, right? My first disaster was, you know, Katrina in New Orleans, you know, I think of all the half those people are in prison now, right? That's just they look out that kind of thing through this process. So it's meticulous, but you guys are in the right place. But the way it works with these buildings, basically, is first they establish what it would cost to put it back exactly the way it was. Now, you can't do that because your codes and standards won't let you do that. But you need to, they look at that number because it sets the bar for certain things in the pro program, what you, what they will give you in mitigation additional. The real thing that you're, where your designers now are, are making their preparations to, to make their submittal to FEMA is what would it cost within reasonable engineering, you know, um, uh, estimating to put the buildings back to where they have to be to meet the current codes and standards, which in this case is your own flood code, right? They have to elevate the utilities, right? So because that is in your code, that because something that FEMA then the program will pay for, I use this example. If you had a um, school built for 50 children in 1950, and you're still using it for 50 kids today, and a tornado wipes it off the map, the school you built today is going to look a lot different, right? Because of ADA and all. It's the same thing for flood code. Once codes are triggered, FEMA just has to pay for those repairs, right? So right now we're in the process of building that because you say to FEMA, this is what it would cost to meet these codes. And this is some other ideas that we have to further flood proof, which you, you, you could do. But then that's the point where Kelly talked about where you say, hey, FEMA, here's, you know, based on your program, everything that, you know, we feel you would put back into these buildings to fix them where they sit. Okay, we'd rather take that money and do something else with it. That becomes the capped project that we spoke of. And that was Waterbury. And that was the first one in the country. Uh, you say, all right, so that fund, and then it just becomes a funding source, right? So, you know, all right, our FEMA funding sources, you know, whatever, 38 million. Our big grant plan, you know, is 48 million. There's a delta there. Then it becomes something, or you just go with repairing as is because that is, you know, baseline. That's what you got. FEMA program will provide right to put you back in those buildings with their old form and function to meet the current codes and standards, plus mitigation. You know, you could do additional things that the codes and standards didn't require. 
you know, I'm just making this up. I don't know that it would work, but, you know, higher floodgates or, you know, the mythical flood wall, right? No one would do a flood wall, but that would be like additional mitigation that no code or standard would require. So that's kind of where, and you guys are in a good place and, and you're part of the complex project group that we have with FEMA. You know, these projects are all, you know, we're, we're thinking that they're all going to work themselves through this process through this late summer and early fall. So that's kind of a nutshell where you are from my perspective. You're in a good place uh, within the process. Um, um, so I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Folks, any questions? Tim, go ahead. I'm Tim. Oh, quick questions. Um, just the whole theme of thing and watching the news like we all do. Um, it's like there's disasters everywhere. From your experience, what's the likelihood that this is going to be funded? Oh, it's so it, it will be funded, right? Because it is, first of all, it's the Stafford Act, right? Robert T. Stafford from Vermont, right, was the, the Stafford Act founder. So it's just, it has to be funded, but it has, it takes an act of Congress. So the um, DRF, the Disaster Recovery Fund, will get low and it'll get to a point where they start to slow down funding because they need to replenish it. And actually, we're in there now, you know, they're only, they're only like letting out money for emergency projects. But as soon as Congress gets together, they'll put money back in it. And I'll tell you this, it's never a problem because, you know, if it's red states this year, it's blue states next year. You know, they always put money in the DRF. It doesn't really come down to that unless it gets tangled up with some other legislation. But the the money going into the DRF is never an issue. So the, it's not a competitive grant in that sense, right, where you're competing against others to get the money, right? And then timing would be my other question in terms of what's a realistic expectation to well, show that, me the money kind of the thing. Current, you know, the current temporary funding freeze aside, you know, you're in the process right now where I would say, you know, you make this submission, you're going to make this request to FEMA for this capped project. I would say that you'll have a decision point, a knowledge point of what you think that funding is going to look like, you know, around the holidays is what we're shooting for through your engineer. And then a funding, you know, what would finally be obligated and, you know, sign on the dotted line, you're probably looking at, you know, into late next spring. Just the way these, I mean, because, right. and, and and Sarah and the team will tell you, there's a whole methodical theme of process that we have to get through that we've been struggling with for many reasons. We'll just say that it's still moving itself along. And, you know, despite anything else, it'll take us long to get these projects obligated. I mean, the state theme of, they're all, you know, sort of, there's a lot of projects for so and yeah. I don't think you're there's no check that's going to come by Christmas <laughs> and then third, not for that one for the other ones maybe. Yeah, I'd say third and last question would be I know there's at least one homeowner here whose home was wiped out by the flood and is applied um so I mean we've talked about the public assistance part for public infrastructure but how about individuals who had significant losses well so loosely speaking you know the the individual assistance program that they go to where FEMA is handing out immediate funding, right? That's where the that, right? I said hypothetically, right? So that being said, if you're talking, then you get into the other grants that are more in my world that are buyouts and elevations, right? And those are technically mitigation grants that take time to develop. Some of those are starting to get approved from the 2023 event, but those usually, you know, they'll be coming. I, I would suspect you'll start to see buyouts going through and you know, started to be funding as early as the end of this next year, and then it'll pick up steam as, you know, they start to get rolled. That's, buyouts and elevations technically aren't assistance grants, they're mitigation grants, right? Okay. But the individual assistance piece of where people have to go apply directly to FEMA, I, I can't speak very directly to that. I, someone in the audience apparently can better than I can. All right, thanks. And, and following up on what uh, you were talking about with Tim, um, what is as, as the process goes through what what's the next event and what should we be expecting to happen next so i would so i would expect the next thing is as your engineer that you know the the last effort was to get your engineer get you this solid number on what it would take to meet your code to put the buildings back to you know where they are to meet what you need to do to meet your own code and maybe add some mitigation um, within the next, uh, that would be a month or two, he's going to come back. And then I think that's sort of a, a period internally where you could start to chew on, all right, this is kind of that number we're hovering around, right? Whether it's um, to take that number and cap it, or is that going to be really what it costs to do these things, you know, to really get us back in there? 
and that's a start. So I'm thinking that report will be your first indication. Then you're going to make the submission to FEMA. They're going to react to that probably if we get in early, sometime around Christmas or around the first year. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's a much more concrete. This is what we're looking at being obligated to have a decision, you know, real concrete. Do we go back or do we look for the funding to go elsewhere? You know, our goal is to get most applicants, including the state and BGS, to that point, you know, by the end of the year. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Any questions? All right. All right. Thank Thanks you a lot. lot. Oh, Nolan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make your acquaintance. Um, my name is Nolan Carver. I serve on the Conservation Commission. Um, so I'm still new to um, sort of how uh, Montpelier is sort of um, evolving to these times. Uh, like I was saying earlier, I live in an ancient floodplain and we're the oldest family in town, basically. And my ancestors survived the 27 flood, which took out uh, my neighborhood and much of this uh, floodplain. I'm just curious, um, can you speak to um, any of um, suggestions for, as far as you mentioned, um, elevations or flood wall? Um, also, um, is there such thing as a preemptive buyout uh, for my mother's house? <laughs> there is a program. There are both those programs. I'd be happy to speak to you outside if you like. But Thank you so much. Those. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Sure. Great. Thanks a lot Thank for you. being here. Yeah, Lisa. Before you go, don't go yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Lisa Edson of uh, my boys and I live in one of the houses that were flooded in July that was flooded. I'm glad you think we're in a really good place. I'm glad there's all this coverage for uninsured situations. We're insured. We've received nothing. We have received no immediate assistance. It's been more than a year we don't have anything in place at all there isn't an rfp out there isn't money available to us we are not allowed to rebuild ourselves how can we sit here a year later more than that the businesses are up and running who weren't insured money is going out for businesses money is going out for municipalities and those of us living in it are receiving no assistance no support no anything you're not even looking at me That's not my really boys my and i Sorry. live in this every single day and there's nothing happening and i keep hearing how there's swift money coming how the legislature moved to get us money quickly that was authorized in June and still isn't available. We're hearing from contractors, they're scheduling two years out and we're still not scheduling. And we live in a house with no walls and no kitchen and no bathroom. We're losing our money off our apartment every month for more than a year. That's a two bedroom unit in Montpelier ready for people to live in. That could be used right now that can't be because of this and yet you stand here and say we're in a great position we're supporting the uninsured what is going on here why aren't things moving forward how is it that i send notes that i never get replies to at all so i'm back here again i know that y'all love when i show up i love when i show up too this is how i want to spend my evening and i'm certain how you all do um but this is insane and the fact that none of it's moving forward and we're getting left out because there aren't very many of us. And so we're just getting tossed to the side. How is this possible? We had insurance. I haven't, every day I pay for my insurance that they've already told me they won't pay anything on for the last year while I pay it because they've already issued half the payment. And I have nothing. My boys have nothing. And there's nothing happening. And Vermont Emergency Management is telling us we're in a great position and that we're ahead. Explain that to me. Specifically, a vendor for the state of Vermont Emergency Management came here to speak about the public assistance program, which is a program that deals specifically with the municipal projects. So what you're talking about is sort of outside of my scope. I'm not here to discuss that. And I don't speak for Vermont Emergency Management on that point. Yeah, we're out of, so I, from that yeah, point, out of everyone's scope. Everyone tells me 
how it's not their fault and that somebody else is responsible. I have insurance. I'm still paying on it. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, John Copans, Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience Update. Thank you so much, Mayor, uh, for the invitation to be here tonight. Thanks for coming. So uh, just a quick a quick reminder, I don't think I probably need to give this, but the commission uh, emerged out of last summer's floods and a series of community forums that took place over the course of the summer last year. Uh, Fifteen volunteers stepped forward to serve on the commission, and I was hired in the springtime. My last time with you was soon after getting hired uh, in the spring. Um, we have three buckets of work, uh, just in terms of categories of focus that really were defined by the community as a whole. And I'll sort of start at the broadest scope, which is really thinking about things at a watershed level. We really, uh, our, our destiny in Montpelier is set well before the water arrives, crosses into our borders. And, and so we, uh, we have a sense that we really have to work with communities uh, up and down the watershed to really collaborate together. We're working on building those relationships and connections and facilitating those conversations. Uh, second, we're thinking about an adaptive downtown. Uh, the, the sad reality is we have a, a sense that we're going to flood again. It, it's going to happen, and we need to strengthen our infrastructure such that we can really minimize our losses and weather that next storm as best as possible. That means working with individual building owners and generally with the with our with our downtown infrastructure, the most flood prone areas in in the city to really uh, make them more more resilient to future future flooding events. And then finally, we're working uh, on uh, a more robust and inclusive emergency response plan as well. Uh, I want to just start with some appreciation uh, for for a couple of things that we. Uh, First, uh, as I think you all know, the city of Barrie and Montpelier collaborated on an EPA community change grant. Uh, I know that took a lot of work. want to acknowledge specifically Josh Jerome, who spent a lot of time on, on that. That proposal includes a significant amount of funding for district heat, which is a resilient system. So kudos on that. But it also includes uh, uh, the potential for this downtown building survey that we are proposing to do where we will work with property owners to really assess those buildings and come up with uh, some recommendations for how best they can flood proof, flood proof those buildings. So really want to thank the city for their work with the city of Barrie and the state recovery officer on that EPA community change grant. I also just want to say that our level of collaboration with the city has just has been excellent. Uh, Soon after I started in the role, the city manager had me into a leadership meeting with uh, with all of the department heads. I really appreciated that opportunity to connect with the team. Uh, I connect with Josh and other members of the staff very consistently, and um, th the sense of collaboration is really excellent. So just just really want to say thank you to uh, all of you, and that really includes you as a council as well. I've appreciated connecting with you as as individuals also. So. Now let me get to a couple of specific projects uh, that we're we're working on. Um, we've talked about it before, but there is a parcel of land called Five Home Farm Way over by the Roundabout and Agway. Um, at this point, that parcel is really controlled by the Preservation Trust Vermont. Eventually, the idea is that that parcel's ownership will be transferred to the city of Montpelier. There's some work being done around how to make that transfer happen, but in the meantime. Uh, SLR Consulting and a gentleman named Roy Schiff, who I'll probably mention a couple of times tonight, he's a Montpelierite and he's a real expert in terms of uh, doing this uh, work around hydrology and, um, and waterways. Roy has been hired by Preservation Trust to develop a site plan for Five Home Farm Way, essentially to return that to floodplain to remove, likely to remove a fair amount of material from that site 
so that it becomes a place where water can really expand and slow down before it reaches the city of Montpelier. It's exactly the kind of project that we're looking for throughout the watershed, but I'd say it's particularly important because of its proximity to our town. You know, we had the chance to walk the site a few weeks ago, and it actually was pretty interesting to get to see that point where the Stevens branch and uh, the main branch of the Winooski come together. I'd never actually laid eyes on it because you can't really see it when you drive by in either direction, but it, but it gives you a sense of, of possibility at that site. Uh, the building on site will be deconstructed next spring, and the hope is that that project will actually proceed next summer. So that uh, we're feeling encouraged by that. And that actually brings me to my next uh, that, thing. I, yeah. John, that, that deconstruction includes the foundation and everything. You know, that's a good question. I actually don't don't know the answer to that. I must, I don't know. Does anybody? Yeah, I can follow up with you on that okay. for sure. I will say rather than demolition, they are deconstructing uh, in part because there's stuff that they can salvage from that. So I was, I think, encouraged to hear that. So, okay. um, to transition to another part of our work as a commission, there is a statewide program that I, I think you're all aware of called the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. It, uh, there is $90 million in that uh, fund that's a mix of mostly federal dollars, but some state dollars. Uh, usually that is a program where there is a required local match for those HMG projects, but in this instance, the, the legislature and the, the administration decided that they would cover the local match for these HMGP projects. And not only did they do that, but they also have, Vermont Emergency Management has hired uh, consulting firms to help really develop those projects because it's a lot of work, a lot of technical work to do the benefit cost analysis. Uh, again, it's this gentleman, Roy Schiff, who's been hired to do this work for, for Montpelier, for Berlin and Barrie, because that's one of the focus areas for this HMGP grant program. Uh, the city, of course, has an active interest in what projects are on that list. There will be city-specific projects, things like the wastewater treatment facility, things like what's called the Dickey Dam up, uh, up in Berlin uh, at the water, uh, at the the water facility up there. I'm not saying it right. It's not the treatment facility, but the um, the drinking water facility up, up in Berlin. And uh, for us as a commission, the reason that we're engaged is we want to be sure that pro there are projects that uh, are impactful in terms of reducing flood elevation uh, here, here in Montpelier. And so, in fact, we are in communication with CBRPC, who is helping to coordinate this through something called the River Program, and with the consultant to really, um, I would say, elevate, and I know that word is a little bit fraught, but to elevate certain projects that we think should stay on the list for evaluation. And those are sort of bigger and more ambitious projects, things like uh, looking at the Bailey Street Dam and the Railroad Bridge or not dam, excuse me, there is a Bailey Dam. I, I meant the Bailey Street Bridge and the Railroad Bridge, because those are really identified as pinch points. Also taking a look at the confluence of the Dog River and uh, the Winooski down uh, at that section, because again, there is a lack of floodplain down there and the sense is that the water backs up from there as well. And then finally, uh, we also have a sense that there there should be sort of a citywide hydrologic and hydraulic study of how the water moves through Montpelier because that sort of system-wide study could be uh, very helpful as we try to identify future projects that'll be impactful here in the city. John, this may be beyond your expertise, but I noted that some of the correspondence we received today regarding Confluence Park mentioned the Dog River field and that being flooded and whether that plays a role. It just makes me wonder, does that play a, a role in, in all of this? You know, I don't want to get out beyond my skis, as, mm -hmm. as some would say, in terms of being an expert on that stuff. I do have some sense that there's clearly interplay, right? It's a system 
And to be honest, like when I first came into this role, I was surprised to hear that something down where the Dog River comes in actually mattered because I think of that as downstream. Oh, that doesn't matter. But the reality is when those pinch points are in close enough proximity to our downtown, it, it really it really does make a difference in terms of the water backing up. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we have the North Branch coming in to the Winooski, that's another place where things back up, right? There's not actually a ton of water coming in through the North Branch, but because it backs up, it really creates creates an issue for that. Thanks. So, so, you know, um, what I would say in terms of bringing this to a close in terms of the HMGP projects, eventually, I think you as a council will probably be brought a list that you will uh, sign off on as a council. I actually am uncertain about whether the things that I've mentioned will be on that list because frankly, I think they need some more research. We need to figure out if they're feasible. What does the timeline look like? But for us, we think it's really important to continue to do that evaluation while we have the services of these experts from SLR Consulting. We really wanna be sure we're thinking broadly about the possibilities uh, in terms of what those projects could look like. And I would I would also note that it is also, and, and I'll give a nod to uh, Council Member Hurl, who's, a, who's a, a member of the commission as well, who has really made this point. The hazard mitigation grant program is not the only potential source of funding when it comes to these projects. Often there are also water quality benefits for floodplain restorations or dam removals. And so uh, it's not like we're only gonna get one bite at the apple. But we do, as a commission, feel like it's really important to keep some of these bigger, more ambitious projects uh, on, on the list, at least for now, until um, until we figure out that maybe they don't make sense for this this current round. Of mm -hmm. All right, thanks, John. I've got one more okay. piece. Sorry. Okay, sorry, but no, don't want to cut you off I, prematurely. Well, but um, I wanted to pause to see if there's other questions around that before I talk a little bit about our emergency uh, response plan for. All right. Uh, the last thing I just want to update folks on is that we are very busy at work on something called the Montpelier Action Plan for Local Emergency, or MAPLE, uh, as we call it. Um, we have had a number of meetings with city staff. We've had a number of meetings with other stakeholders in, in really trying to develop the scope of what that plan looks like. And to be clear, it is not just a plan for municipal operations in times of emergency. It's really intended to be a community-based plan because the reality is we all act as a community when we're in these times of, of crisis. And that's both in the preparedness phase, in the response phase, and in the recovery phase. And we, we feel like having a stronger sense of who does what is really critical. Uh, uh, we have just in the last week or so, transmitted essentially a gap analysis and set of recommendations as a draft to the city manager. And that is being circulated among city staff. And concurrently, our consultant, we're working with a consultant on this, our consultant is working on the first steps of drafting the actual plan. It's our expectation that we will have a draft plan ready for the community in September, and that we'll have a public forum at the end of September, or early October, uh, for the community to really look at and evaluate that plan, provide us with feedback. And then there will be a, and also again, for the city to have that opportunity and, and city staff. And then the ideas will come back with a proposed plan to you as a council, because ultimately that'll be a plan that uh, ideally the, the council adopts for the city and really for the community as a whole. All right. Now, anyone have questions? So, uh, thank you, John. A great update. Um, there, there's a lot more <laughs> I'd like to know, but uh, I'm curious about the the watershed work, which is which is a giant project, but particularly the the hydrology study you mentioned of how water moves through the city of Montpelier. I feel like the council has decisions coming up over the next year that it all depends on what the, what the river does, you know, um, how the river wants to flow and what we do about that. Um, what's the anticipated timeline on that giant watershed 
project? You know, it's 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 in conception phase at this point, so I can't give you some yeah. specifics. I'll actually give a little uh, shout out to Stephen Whitaker. He pointed me towards a um, webinar that I did have a chance to participate in recently where they use LIDAR technology in the city of Lindenville because Lindenville has had persistent fund funding flooding issues. And that LIDAR really provides a level of detail that is impossible to create in, a, in another way. And so it's really use of those kind of technology that I think when you couple that with consultants who have expertise, you can come up with much, much more precise sort of senses of what's likely to happen and then recommended efforts uh, to address uh, address those situations. Yeah. Well, yeah, good. I mean, it, it's great that, that, I mean, there will be technology that'll help, you know, make that move faster, I hope. Um, but it's good to know that we're on the track to sort of nail that stuff down because there's a lot of, a lot of decisions that sort of depend on, um, you know, there's a, um, a, a, a an order, a sequence that has to be, has to be followed. So appreciate, appreciate the comments. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're sensitive to that sequence when we think about five home farm way because sure. in fact, as an example, there are other parcels adjacent that also may well have some floodplain opportunities. For example, the agency of transportation's garage is right next door, and they are looking at sort of essentially depopulating that facility and tearing down that facility. So when we think about how we design the project at five home farm way, one of the things we said to the consultant is be sure you're doing that with anticipation that that other project is actually going to happen so that it all fits together as a whole as opposed yeah. to as individual pieces. Yeah, exactly the kind of thing I'm thinking about, yeah. Sure. Thank you, John, this is really helpful. Um, you talked about the three buckets that you had and one of them was about, um, I tried to write down what you said, but about an adaptive downtown yeah. and about you know recognizing that we're going to have a flood again and what's going to happen. And and I heard you making reference to businesses and helping kind of support what's happening with the downtown businesses. But I wondered if that was just what you, the, the wording that you happen to use right now, or if you're really no, looking I, at more inclusive, including I, residential I, and I think everything. to be clear, what we have focused on is sort of the hundred structures that are in our downtown that were flood impacted. So that certainly is beyond just businesses. It's in, it's residences. It is uh, a whole host of organizations. It's government buildings as well. So thank you for making that clarification. <laughs> Anything else from members of the council? Lauren. Thanks, John. Um, just wondering if you could, for a minute, uh, just the other area of work, the River's Edge Master Plan, just because the next topic on our agenda, Confluence Park, it would just be helpful to give kind of a snapshot of the latest thinking there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I'm building sort of ta task forces to do that work. And and that, just to, to zoom out, uh, one of the priorities for the commission is to really look at that river's edge as uh, throughout Montpelier and to think holistically about what we're doing with that uh, river's edge uh, and how, what the appropriate ways to develop that are. And, and uh, the sense is we've done a fair amount of planning as a community, but we haven't ever done anything specific to the river's edge. And given what we've gone through with recent flooding events, that there is real real good reason to do that as, as an important exercise. And so we are, in fact, I just had a conversation with somebody at the state who suggested a potential funding source for that project. And I'm in the process of forming a team that will help carry that forward. You know, included on that team, ideally, is uh, somebody from the State uh, Department of Building and General Services, because so much of that river frontage is controlled by the state. So they are really a critical partner. We're also talking to the Capital Complex Commission. I spoke to your uh, director of planning, Mike Miller, about this project as well. So we're we're really sort of building that team. But the sense is we really uh, want to think holistically about that entire entire uh, riverfront. Yeah. Anything else for members of the council? Any questions or comments from members of the public? 
No, I see. Oh, go ahead, Steve. I I'm, I'm, want to just raise a couple of issues. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, this, the, the commission is not a government-created entity, to my understanding. Uh, it's not subject to public records law. And in effect, we're wrestling with an issue or dancing around an issue of whose responsibility is it to write Montpelier's uh, emergency preparedness and response plan. And I would argue those are clearly government functions. I don't object, and I think it would be prudent to contract with the commission for that piece. But I think the responsibility and the uh, obligation to assure its thoroughness and to possibly create a cost-sharing structure with our neighbor towns, because this is a watershed, uh, this is not something that is typically done by a nonprofit on their own initiative and and we get the result. This is a government function and I don't wanna see us make the same mistakes we've made with Good Samaritan. Uh, so I, I wanna drive that point home. Uh, to address Carrie's question and I had spoken to John and Christian about this, the identifying the critical flood level and the using that LIDAR measurement, which can be both done in the water, measuring the shape of the river bed and the capacity of the river bed, as well as uh, the lowlands and flood, flood zones. Uh, we can prioritize and plan for which buildings are gonna get hit in which sequence and channel our response for sandbags and mitigation and pumps in that way by doing it very uh, consciously through pre-planning. And so that that I think uh, might speak to your concern, but I, I'd ask you to give some real thought to providing necessary funding, but being very clear on whose role and whose obligation and who's in transparency. I am gonna find out how much they're paying him. It's just a matter of time. Thanks, Steve. Nolan. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, John. It's me, Nolan Carver. Um, so, excuse me, um, I serve on the Conservation Commission, and um, I just wanted to point out the fact that you had mentioned um, we're demolishing um, that historic house over by Agway. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah, we're deconstructing. Um, and in that same sense, we're deconstructing history. Um, are you familiar with the history of that house? It goes back to the founding father of Montpelier, apparently, that belong to uh, the namesake, um, Colonel Jacob Davis. Um, I just wanted to mention that there are real people, you know, with real problems. Um, it's just that it's a cultural heirloom is hard to say goodbye to like an old rocking chair. Um, it, it, it pains me to see that place go. Uh, perhaps I can paint a portrait and, 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 and hang it on a wall. Uh, but honestly, I almost wish that we could pick the thing up and, and put it in Shelburne Museum. Um, so thank you for your, your support. I look forward to working with you and seeing you around town more often. Thanks, Nolan. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Next up, we're at Confluence Park. And while we're getting setting up, I'll getting set up, I'll just mention that, uh, We've we've received a lot of uh, emails on this topic on on both sides of the uh, of the issue and any any of the emails that uh, have just come to me directly or to or or just to the council members I've also forwarded to the city manager so those could all be uh, kept together and uh, be part of the public record for this and. Uh, I appreciate everyone's thoughts on this. I know that there are equally strongly held positions on both both sides.
Um, well, uh, why don't you turn it off? While she's setting up, I will just tee this up a little bit. Um, in February of uh, 23, this project was brought to the city council, uh, proposed you know, with a budget and funding. And at that point, obviously, the city council made a decision that it would not commit any more than the city's already approved amount of money uh, of $600,000 and gave the, the project people 18 months to secure the remaining funding. So that 18 months uh, expired earlier this month in August. And so that's uh, it would it's proper timing for the, the group proposing the project to come back and give you an update on the, the project and the where they stand with uh, the status of funding. And then I think your choices are to decide, uh, as I understand it, they don't have the full funding, but Tasha, well, I don't want to steal her thunder, will we'll give us a presentation and you would decide whether you wanted to continue to provide more time or end the project now or however you wanted to proceed with this. So that's what's before us tonight. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Kasha. Uh, my name is Kasha Ranjo and I am one of the co-directors of Vermont River Conservancy. Um, you just heard from the Commission on Flood Recovery and Resilience. And um, as John mentioned, they've developed five top priorities and one of which is a river's edge master plan. And that is specifically to identify opportunities for increasing green resilient infrastructure and public access to and connection with rivers. This aligns with what I hear in our community, uh, whether it's in the post flood forums around town and casual conversations, I've heard over and over again, and I know you have too, we need green flood resilient infrastructure along our riverfront. This brings us to Confluence River Park, which is green flood resilient infrastructure that's designed and ready to be built. Resilience is core to our work at Vermont River Conservancy and projects underway across the watershed, some of which John shared. And this is where Confluence River Park fits into the overall puzzle. Um, upstream of downtown, um, in Worcester last year, a floodplain that my organization worked to protect, uh, the floodwaters rose several feet across these protected wetlands. And that single project kept inches of rain outside of Wrightsville Reservoir. And you all remember that the reservoir was one inch from overtopping its spillway. And so we're actively looking at um, more of these types of projects in Worcester and Plainfield and Berlin, all projects that would keep Montpelier safer during floods. There are floodplain restoration projects underway at Home Farm Way that John just talked about. Um, Friends of the Winooski is working on multiple dam removals in Barrie. And for us in 2021, a couple years before our community flooded, Vermont River Conservancy sent things in motion to look at removing four local dams. One of these, the Bailey Dam near Shaw's, is rising to the top of the list of likely FEMA projects. Um, also, John just mentioned. And because we were ahead of the game before the flooding, the design for that project is underway. It's happening now. A year from now, designs will be complete for removal of the Bailey Dam. And it, because it's rising to the top of this FEMA project list at well, as well, it could well have funding for removal by 2026. And this is important because this is the same timeline as Confluence River Park. So the trucks mobilized to get on site for dam removal could also do excavation for confluence. And the truck, uh, this would be potentially a huge cost savings that would make the most of every dollar invested in both of the projects and an end result of side by side flood mitigation and flood resilience right in the heart of downtown. Together, these types of projects are doing as much as possible to create a more natural river with space to slow and store flood water. Confluence River Park will all give all of us a place where in a city that's filled with rivers and bridges, people can finally actually get to the newly restored river to enjoy a cup of coffee with friends, cast a line, take a paddleboard out on their lunch break, all via design that strengthens the banks of the river to hold up during intense flooding. And here's how close we are to making this a reality. 
We've raised 43% of the dollars needed to move con to construction. No, we are not 100% of the way there, but we're 43% of the way there. And if any of you have ever been involved with fundraising, you know that the first 40% is the hardest to raise, the next 30% is easier, the final 30% easier still, and there's a rule of momentum in fundraising and we have momentum. I've been working hard to wrangle opportunities and creatively thinking about what I can do to bring outside dollars and investment into our town. And there's some big new opportunities coming up that weren't possible a year ago. So one of these is EPA Brownfields funding. A year ago, the same grant opportunity have a, had a $500,000 cap and it required a significant match, which made it out of reach and not attainable for this. New this year, we can apply for a million dollars or more, and there's no match required. I took the head of EPA's Northeast region and the Vermont lead on a walking tour of our riverfront. I showed them Confluence River Park, and they were excited about the vision. I asked how they prioritize their funding, and their response, they said, it's based on community priorities. And it's, if it's a clear community priority, they want to make it happen. This is where the city's bond commitment is crucial. It's a financial investment that demonstrates community commitment. And while this grant doesn't require a match, the city's bond commitment is a key way to demonstrate commitment and competitively bring these outside dollars into Montpelier. Another on the list here is the Land and Water Conservation Fund. These are federal dollars administered by each state. Vermont hasn't had an LWCF grant proposal for at least three to four years. They haven't administered these federal dollar grants. This summer, they finally put out materials in a timeline and we can apply again for up to $1 million. This grant requires a 50-50 non-federal match, which is where the federal's bond commitment is cru crucial to maximize the dollars we can bring into our downtown infrastructure. Another one here on the fall 2024 opportunities is the Lake Champlain Basin Program. They have already invested $200,000 into this park. They're excited to see it happen. And they told me that they would be glad to see another proposal from us this fall and excited to commit more funding to this project. Together, these three grants, all newly available this fall, can bring more than $1.6 million in outside funding into our downtown. We're very close to making the community's 30-year vision a reality. So here's our request tonight. Retain the city's bond commitment to Confluence River Park, which is no cost to the city at this time, through the end of May 2025, in order to demonstrate clear city commitment, build on initial momentum, and bring outside investment into Montpelier's downtown. Most of you here have taken me up on my invitation to go walk along our riverfront. And here's what I heard from you. You want to see us transition our economy from being overly reliant on state employees who are never going to return to 2020 numbers to a more resilient economy that leverages our recreation resources and outdoor amenities. Every riverfront park ever developed in this country has seen overwhelming economic returns. Burlington's lakefront generates $10,000 to $40,000 for their city every day. You heard from Marty a year ago, who I met for the first time here in city council chambers on Zoom, as you did October of last year when I presented. And I don't know about you all, but I was blown away by his experience. His hometown in New Hampshire was a crumbling mill town with one restaurant. The community rallied together to transform its riverfront, opening a park similar to Confluence in 2021. Now, just three years later, the riverfront park has catalyzed a newly thriving, revitalized net downtown that supports nine restaurants. This is the generational investment in our community that can be central, this generational investment will be central accessible place for people to enjoy a, eat a lunch by the river, cast a line, launch a boat, splash with kids, 
all opportunities to draw people into Montpelier and help revitalize our vibrant downtown. I heard for you all say that you wanna see outside dollars invested in this community, generate grant support to multiply what we could achieve with city dollars alone. And this project brings more than $2.4 million in outside investment into our community, adding more than $4 for every dollar that we put in. And finally, I heard many of you say that you're frustrated by seeing this town plan and design and work towards good ideas that never come to fruition. We have the chance to do something different here. Plans are in hand and ready to go. I hope you'll choose to continue to commit to this park and you choose to have a positive impact on our community for generations to come. Confluence River Park is designed and ready to go. It's a step in the right direction and let's retain the city's bond commitment and take this step forward for community resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Kasia. Council members, any uh, any questions or or thoughts? I I do expect to take uh, comments and questions from the public. Also, of course, uh, Lauren. One question before hearing more from the public. Um, could you just describe so of the committed funding so far? Um, like, what are are there like time limits on when decisions need to be made, or does some of that start to go away? Like, like what are the constraints around that that we should be aware for of? the current commitments. for the current commitments? Yeah, yeah. So, um, of the current commitments, um, there is currently a LWCF grant of about three hundred thirty thousand um, dollars that the city has that has been extended in the past. The city that is through the end of December 2024 this year, um, we have the opportunity to extend that again. What we just learned last week is that this grant program is unique and that you can actually, they the state has the choice to add dollars to a previous grant outside of a competitive process. So there's a competitive process this fall where we could apply to a new additional $1 million dollars and or we're meeting that Josh and I are meeting with them next week, they could add funds to our existing grant and extend the deadline. Um, so that's one of them. Lake Champlain Basin Program um, has several years on it and they're also fairly flexible. Um, Vermont Out Arts Council um, expires the, the soonest. Um, and then I think uh, I'm less certain of the downtown transportation and clean water fund. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's let's start taking comments from members of the public. Are there people in the room who'd like to be heard? Why don't you come on up your see all your hand first? Um. Hello, Montpelier City Council. Thank you so much for that presentation, Kasia. I feel like you basically said everything, but I'm just going to come up and discuss why I think the Confluence River Park is an important project for our town to take on. And before you get going, could you tell us who you are? Yeah, um, I'm Lena D'Onofrio. I'm a fellow Montpelier resident and a 12th grader at Montpelier High School. Um, I'm passionate about ecology, climate change, and our community's relationship and responsibility to the rivers and the natural world around us. Um, obviously, we all remember the historic flooding that shook our city last summer, whose echoes still rattle our infrastructure and collective psyche. Since then, we've had enough scares and close calls and watched enough neighbors be hit by yet another catastrophic flooding event to know that this wasn't just some coincidence. This is a real problem that is rising up towards us, and it's going to continue facing us. Now is the time to ask how we are going to face it back. What does moving forward look like? Right now, it's easy to feel like our rivers are nothing more than inconveniences or even enemies. In reality, rivers are an adaptable, fluid part of nature, and they only rise against us because we have channelized and altered them in such a way that today they cannot meander through robust wetlands or adapt to extreme weather like they are supposed to. When we try to suppress or ignore the rivers, they only surge up to slap us in the face later. So moving forward means prioritizing the rivers. It means implementing creative, resilient solutions around interacting with them. 
It means embracing the idea that strengthening our rivers goes hand in hand with strengthening our connection to the rivers, and that doing so will strengthen our communities in turn. I believe that the Confluence River Park embodies these ideals, and that moving forward with it will help us achieve them. Firstly, the plan takes unused lots and turns them into green spaces, fostering ecosystems um, and native vegetation in these places. The soil there will have a higher capacity for storing and processing rainwater, and banks that are supported by strong ecosystems will better support our infrastructure and our rivers at the same time. Additionally, these green spaces will provide people with the chance to enjoy our rivers, allowing for recreation and positive interaction that will help dismantle some of the understandable stress and fear surrounding our rivers right now. If we implement ecologically sensitive, flood-minded projects that benefit each other and our place, like the Confluence River Park, we turn the rivers into our friends and we move toward a more resilient tomorrow. Uh, thank you for listening and considering my input. I hope you all have a great night. Thanks, Lena. Thanks for coming. I saw another hand, but I'm not sure who's. Steve. Hi, thanks for being there. I'm Steve Cease. I live on North Street. Um, good evening, folks. Um, I'm here actually to urge you to retract your commitment to the Confluence Park for a number of reasons, which I outlined in a letter to you that I, I sent you earlier this afternoon. I hope you've had a chance to read it. And I've got to say, it's no fun to stand up here and say, let's pull the funding for a project that means so much to so many people. That's basically a, a kind of a destructive act. But I but I do think under the circumstances the city is facing, it's, a, it's an important idea, and I, I urge you to take that step. I outlined a number of reasons why I thought that um, it was important to take that step in my letter, and I don't want to repeat it verbatim or even go into too much detail. I will tell you that I've been a uh, longtime paddler in the city. I've, I've probably launched my kayak dozens of times down at the interstate overpass over the years. I've walked and run and biked through most of the parts of the city, and I think Riverside recreation is, an, is a really important issue for the city. This is just not the time to do it. The city is facing other priorities. We know we're facing huge financial obligations between um, our infrastructure. We seem to have a water main bursting out of a street every week. Um, we have flood protection and flood remediation. We've got the unbelievably huge task of confronting homelessness. and. Money is, on the other hand, is short. We're looking at a potential double-digit increase again on the education side of our tax bill this coming year. There's, and we don't think there's going to be a lot more tax money available to meet some of these needs, or at least I don't think there will be. So it seems to me that almost every penny counts. And I think the money we've set aside for this project could be redirected to one of those other, I think, more uh, pressing needs and priorities. Um, I mentioned a few things in my in my letter that I just want to touch on briefly. We don't really know, and I, I was interested to hear Don Copans talk about a, a, a hydrologic study for the watershed basin. We don't know what's going to happen in years to come, except that it's going to be worse than things that we've seen already. At some point, Wrightsville is likely to overtap. We don't know what that will mean. Um, we just don't know what will happen at the uh, conjunction or confluence of the of the North Branch and the Winooski, but it's not going to be good. And among other things, it's likely to have impacts on this project. We don't know if this project will help or hurt or be neutral in the face of some of those big events, but we know that the project will be, will, will suffer. It'll be, even in regular high water events, it'll silt uh, in high water events, debris and uh, silt and sedimentation will land there. Who's gonna maintain this project in years to come? And does the city have the commitment either in money or manpower to take that task on. On that point, I noted that we already have several Riverside properties in the city that, to my eye at least, have been ignored. One is the Dog River Recreation Park, which hosted probably two or three soccer pitches and two baseball fields. I was down the other day, the, play, the fields look unplayable. It was actually standing water and the base path. Oops, that's, that, that's your time. Am I all, oh, yep. Mr. Mayor, I've hardly gotten started. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's anyway. a good thing you put it all in writing, too. Okay, us. it's all in writing. May I just say one thing unrelated to my letter? Um, there's a wonderful podcast by a Montpelier High School graduate named Emmett Fitzgerald, um, which is called, well, it's on Pacifica Radio. It's a part of a, a series called 99% Invisible. He did a specific part podcast about the flood in Montpelier. I really hope you can listen to it. And I'll try to send you a link tonight or tomorrow. It's a wonderful piece and very thought-provoking about the issues that are confronting yep. the city. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Sir.
Sorry to go on. It's it's okay. There's a lot to this. Donna. Oh. Come on up, Donna. Donna, you're up. <laughs> Welcome. Donna Bate, I live in Montpelier on North 10th Street. And I've been a strong supporter of not only Confluence Park, but investing in the future. It's like a savings account. You have to keep putting money in or you never get ahead. And I feel like the investments we've made in the past have paid off many times forward. And this money is set aside. We don't have a bond charging us interest. It's set aside with the authority to make the bond. And the new, everything you said is like, everybody is more aware that we need to put money in this. There's more grant possibilities now than 18 months ago. So I would really not want to put the brakes on now. And Dog River is an example that we haven't invested in, that we've just taken it for granted. And so this is, Dog River is a model of what we shouldn't do because we've always been strapped with money. And so we just let it go by. So I encourage you to have a vision and to keep that money and give them more time. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Steve. Uh, I'm just kind of sp split the baby between the last two. I think given the project more time is uh, reasonable. It is a nice vision. I imagine it maybe 10 years from now. I think it's absurd to create, be talking about or planning to create more park space when we can't maintain what we got. There's no bathroom facilities in this plan and yet we can't even get the transit center bathrooms open. You know, we've got raw sewage entering right above this proposed location, combined sewer overflow. And until we get that in hand, I don't wanna recommend or build infrastructure for people paddling in the river. I mean, I see kids swim in that river, you know, and then a storm comes and raw sewage goes in the river. It's not, it's not well integrated with what else we're wrestling with right now. I think that confirming this, I don't know if it's been engineered, but it's been planned conceptually. Uh, the engineering for this park after we get our dams removed uh, is in order. I mean, like I said, I, I support the vision, uh, maybe not so much concrete and certainly uh, address the public facilities. Uh, you know, right now it, it feels like another attempt to take away the Girton Park, take away the, you know, the info booth, take away any place the homeless converge and pave it over with something where the homeless can't be. And this is where the homeless converge right now. So for lack of any better place, which is a whole nother topic that you need to deal with. Thanks, Steve. Anybody, I don't see any other hands in the room. Um, if anyone is watching online who would like to be heard, please uh, raise your electronic hand or your physical hand, but ele electronically, I'll, I'm more likely to see you. I just realized. Oh, that, Dee Dee. Uh, I just realized the screen is still up. Do you want me to swap to the people on the screen? Is that for, helpful for you? Yeah, why don't you stop sharing? And, and Dee Dee, you, uh, I know you're here for this. You're muted, but you're you'll be going to be unmuted just a second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Dee Dee. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like are. to thank you both, the city council and the other members of the um, committee, uh, the Confluence Park Committee, et cetera. Um, I am not convinced at all that the Confluence Park meets the needs and goals that they have projected. The community priority, I would question whether this is still a priority of the committee, uh, excuse me, the community. And I would ask that the city council and or the Vermont River Conservancy double check that because since they were first um, proposing this as a project, I suspect the priorities have shifted pretty conserv 
uh, considerably. We do not do a very good job because of resources and staffing of taking care of the public spaces we already have. Witness the um, roundabout, the city hall park, the transit center plantings, the uh, bike path, all of which need considerable maintenance, none of which is happening, which suggests to me that we do not have what we need to take care of a whole nother city park, not the least of which is a park on a very, very steep slope, which probably means particular expertise. I also wonder whether um, the statement about this being a no cost to the city at this time is really true. We did vote for the $600,000 but um, if that is not approved by the city council to move forward, um, I wonder what happens next. It sounds to me as if the commitment means that the upfront cost will not be covered. So where does that go in the budget? And I don't think that our project really compares to other riverfront development projects because we have a river which feed which is fed by the north branch creating pretty strict strategic excuse me strong um currents i don't think you can just let a kid out there for paddling i don't think you can just paddle board your boat and easily get back to the landing site and finally, I am not at all convinced that this project is a river resilient and would withstand another six to nine feet of rise in the river flow from a flooding event. It does not look like that to me when I look at the um, uh, drawings. So I am not at all in favor of the city council approving the $600,000 to go forward. We have many, many, many other needs in this city, which are much more urgent and much more pressing for humanity and for the lifeblood, lifeblood of the city. And I Thanks, hope Judy. that, that, that is your time. consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bill. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. My name is Phil Dodd. Uh, I should start by saying I'm very supportive of the River Conservancy's work to, to create more floodplains. I appreciate the overall effort to take advantage of our river, but I just don't think the, the cost, timing, or location of this project uh, is appropriate. Uh, they were given 18 months to raise this funds, and they're less than halfway there. The cost is now up to $3 million. And a lot has changed in the last 18 months. We've, we've had this flood. Uh, our, our city budget uh, had to be cut to bare bones. Uh, we're, we're in tough financial shape. Uh, and uh, as Steve mentioned, our homeless problem is, has worsened. I, I think we could use this money for other purposes, uh, paving, water mains, other infrastructure. And uh, I'm saying this in the context of the very high property taxes we already have. Our municipal taxes are among the highest in the state. Act 127 is going to be pushing up our school taxes for the next few years. Um, the other part of this is, is the location just does not seem great to me. If, if you're sitting in this park, you'll see the back of Shaw's and the back of the Shell Station. Uh, it's a, in a difficult spot on the bike path. I mean, right now I know parents who won't let their kids ride their bike down there because of uh, it's become a, it's kind of a hangout spot. And I'm not sure why this project would would change that. Um, so we 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 do have, as Steve Whitaker said, a need to to find some solution to that. But I don't see one on the horizon. Um, as Dee Dee said, these currents are fairly strong there. Could we need a swift water rescue boat if we have this project? Because someone may tumble in. Uh, I think there's already been a rescue required down along that stretch. Uh, and I also think there are better places to get in the river. Down by the high school, there's a way, a place to do it. 
and there is the uh, under the overpass uh, farther out State Street. Uh, finally, there's the concern about the cost and maintenance and who's going to keep it clean. I think I sent some photos earlier to most of you on the council about uh, about what it looks like there now and what roundabout park looks like today. So the bottom line, I think you should take advantage of that second bond vote we had on this project, which would allow you to take this money and spend it on other pressing projects. So my hope is that you'll vote to stop the project from going forward with city money. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm looking online to see if there are any other hands up and I'm not seeing any. Nolan, I see you raised your hand a minute ago. Mayor, it's me, Nolan Carver from the Conservation Commission. I've been uh, attending some of these information uh, sessions um, about this Confluence Park. Um, I'd like to speak from the heart and I'd like to speak to the heart of my community. This park has the right ideals. This is about investing into the soul of Montpelier. It's It's been absent uh, since these uh, great floods. The people need a place to come together and it's not working out for restaurants, at least not the way it was a couple years ago. But she's right. The state workers aren't coming out like they used to be. It's time to reinvent our city. Um, it's time to search for that precarious balance um, of humanity. Uh, that is what can happen in a beautiful place. Uh, people can form community. Uh, naturally, community policing happens. Our local MPD does not want to be sitting around all day in a cruiser, uh, babysitting uh, the local um, addicts, drug dealers, homeless, alcoholics. I should know. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm mentally ill. Uh, if it wasn't for some other great resources around the community, I might be down there uh, myself, but I'm afraid to go there. I'm being harassed and intimidated when I walk by there. Uh, that's problematic. I, I intend to prosecute just so I can walk by there without being harassed. It's dangerous. Thank you. Thanks, Nolan. Folks, I don't want to cut off uh, discussion prematurely. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? Or council members, do you have a... Uh... Go ahead, Bill. Just, just before the council starts deliberation, I want to make one point clear for the public and for the council is uh, understand um, if you choose not to go forward with this, of the six hundred thousand, we will owe one hundred fifty thousand on uh, a grant funds that we got that would be covered if we did the project. So I just want to make sure everyone understands that we would be on the hook for one hundred fifty thousand. So when they, if if funds were to be redistributed, it would be four hundred and fifty thousand, not six. This one, make sure that's a factual piece of factual information that you all have before you debate. Thanks, Bill. Tim, based on the redistribution bill. So if we go that route, what's our latitude in terms of what those funds could be used for? Is it restricted to riverfront or parks or? Um, I probably want to come back. You know, we probably have a future meeting about that. The so I'm kind of making this up, so take it, but the, the, there was a single bond article that initially passed us that listed a bunch of projects. And we reworded that bond issue to make it more flexible to move money amongst those projects. I'm pretty comfortable saying that anything that was in that list is absolutely in and included some things. I don't, I'm less comfortable talking about if we go beyond that, I'd want to okay. get more information about that. But wasn't this the the item that included the uh, maybe doing a wood heating plant yeah, at the town yeah, garage, right. and then we wanted to give ourselves more flexibility on whether it was going to be wood or something else? May may not be the right year. Yeah. Okay. We can find the art. Yeah. But whatever the vote the voters passed is what uh, is a permissible use for that money. Adrian, thank you so much for your presentation and um, 
I voted for the Confluence Park. I can see the vision of the Confluence Park. Um, as many of you know, I'm a huge advocate for recreation in Montpelier, and I've traveled the country and I've seen the benefits of, you know, recreation at the river. And in those cities that I visited, they are a little bit more mature in our, you know, resources, our funding. It's kind of like, um, you know, a plus project. And so one of my concerns is, you know, we build it and how are we going to maintain it? It's kind of what people have said throughout the emails today, which the more I've sat on city council, the more I've learned about our city government, our resources, our budgets. I would hate to spend, you know, well, $600,000 plus all your fundraising efforts, which is huge amount of effort to build something and then not have a very strong plan to maintain it. Um, I would hate to see an a infrastructure like that just crumble without a plan to support it, to clean it, to fix it, um, you know, a 10, 20 year plan. I don't know if that's part of your process or thinking, but I would love to see something like that so that we don't build something that ends up deteriorating and falling into the river. Um, well, I can speak to a, a piece of that, and I think um, it actually ties into the, some of the questions um, people are asking about, is it really resilient, and will this actually withstand floods? And um, this, the designs for this park were built by Roy Schiff with SLR Engineers, and you heard his name about 12 times for tonight, <laughs> because he's also designing the dam removals, and he's also designing Home Farm Way, and he's also helping with the hydrology to figure out which are the most important flood mitigation projects. He is one of the very best hydrologists in the entire state or region and has a fantastic sense of the future of our rivers and how these projects knit together and is thinking about how each thing ties to the next and what it means. And so he is, he is an expert far beyond any of us here and saying, if it floods, can it withstand? And the answer is yes, they've done everything possible, run models, everything to say, can this hold up? And that's, that's what they built is something that's designed to hold up. And then the construction itself is designed to, you asked about maintenance, and I think that kind of ties to it in that it's designed to be low maintenance general, generally in the sense that it uses native plantings and secure construction and, and um, materials that are, you know, bolted down and, and natural materials on site. He would be here with me, but he had a personal obligation today. Um, and so part of the maintenance is, is, calling for low maintenance. Another piece is that the way that space is used today is that it's the back of everything. And it's a place for people to hide and it's for it's a it's a place for people to hang out and and try to get away. And in other communities when parks like this are developed, it cha transforms the space into the back of where anyone wants to be into a gem of the community where people want to be. And um, this is the same case, and I mentioned Marty earlier in Franklin, New Hampshire. His park there um, was a giant homeless encampment. They built the park. Similar to ours, there's nothing to keep people out of it. It's open. It's welcoming. Anybody can go there. But because it is now a useful park where people can actually go and hang out and enjoy, people are using it every single day of the year and the homeless folks have dispersed. And so those types of things change the maintenance and the use. And there is maintenance required now, there will be maintenance you know, for that site now, there will be maintenance required in the future. Um, what that looks like will probably be different when it's a park than dealing with the challenges that are there now. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So thank you for that explanation. One of the things I'm always thinking about is, and I don't, I'm not an expert in this, so hopefully someone else can answer this question, but so you have the fundraising component, you have the design, but what capacity is needed from city staff to support this project? So it's not always about the money and the fundraising, but we also have to layer in city staff capacity and thinking about this as a project in their portfolio and what is it taking away from? And so this will be added to staff's work. 
And so when I'm thinking about that, what is it that they're not focused on? And so how much capacity is going to be required of our city staff to support this project? I can, is my or, well, we've, um, Josh, Mike, Bill, we've, um, we've talked about this in the past and, um, I, the city owns the land, this, and the city, in fact, contracted with Vermont River Conservancy and we contracted with SLR in order to do this project. So we created the sign, the, the plans at the city's bidding, at the city's council's request and with city funding. And so, and and that's where we were leading the community outreach and everything. And so at this point, some of the grant funding are pieces that Vermont River Conservancy has applied for and will receive those dollars. Some of the grant funding, the municipality has to be the applicant like LWCF and Vermont River Conservancy did quite a bit of the proposal work in partnership with the city the city submitted the proposal and the city received those dollars. So the ultimately the funds will be mixed together. And I think this is a question that's open to the city. How much do the city staff want to be hiring the contractor and bidding out and doing all those things? Or in a situation to say, hey, Vermont River Conservancy or some other partner organization, can you make this happen? And we're aware, we're informed, we're bought in, but it's not city staff time that's actually doing the implementation. It's 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 others impl partners implementing the designs. Thanks, Cut. Mike. Did do I, you have an answer? Well. We talked about that a little bit in the past. Yeah, Mike Miller, planning director. Um, so yeah, any of these projects usually have a couple of different components to them. So you're going to have the grant administration component. So finance and and all those pieces, who's tracking it? And Kasha talked a little bit about the fact we got a lot of grants, a lot of pieces that takes a certain amount because certain certain funding sources can pay for certain things. So you have to organize the project and the grants in certain ways to make sure that if this can only pay for site work and this can only pay for brownfield work and this one can, you have to make sure you've got everything laid out and organized. And that takes a certain level of of grant administration. That may be a city person that has to go and do that. That may be, you know, we may work with the River Conservancy. We haven't gotten there yet, so we don't know exactly how that would work, but we do this on a regular basis, whether it's DPW, whether it's uh, Josh uh, and folks in my office. I um, also know uh, Alec does work out of the parks doing some grant administration as well. So we would figure out who's the best person, who's the most appropriate person to handle the grant administration. Second piece being, project management, how do we manage the construction side of things? Who's doing the RFPs? Who's doing the bidding? Um, how do we get all these lined up? Again, I think that's a piece that we would look at afterwards to see um, whether we have the capacity, whether somebody at um, DPW has the capacity, they did all of the Confluence Park pieces. You know, is, is this a small project that they can add to their list or is this a project that we just have to add some funding to do the um to, to outsource and some of the grants will cover sometimes cover these these costs outside to, to bring in somebody outside whether it's the river conservancy or whether it's a, a third party that would come in to manage the project so we'll look at both pieces but at this point we haven't really gotten to that step of who's doing what piece in that um in the big picture I, I, do, go ahead bill yeah to that point um and I'm not really arguing for or against this, but I want to, I, I do think the history of this is important. Uh, I know Kasha referenced it, but this was initially uh, contemplated in the master plan that developed the transit center project and the bike path. And that's the reason why a green space is left where that bike path is, was that the idea was a, a more fully developed confluence park with access to the river would be, would be, um, Put there. In fact, that was in the initial bond vote, I think, in 2002 for that project. As that project went through and had to go through all of its brownfield work and federal work and all those kind of things, uh, this that was a piece that got left out of that project for financial reasons. So after that project was con uh, completed or near completion, the then city council said, we want to complete the rest of this project. How can we raise the funds to do this and asked 
um, the River Conservancy to take the lead on the fundraising and designing a project and doing the community process. So, uh, you know, what you all decide to do is what you all decide, but it needs to be clear this wasn't a group of individuals of the Vermont River Conservancy sort of running off, creating a project because they thought it was a cool idea. It was as cautious. The city council wanted to do this and asked that we pursue it. Now, I think the costs certainly changed dramatically from when it was first, you know, figured out. But so I think that's important. So from with that in mind, our perspective has been this is a city project. This is a city council supported project. It would be in our queue of projects and you would help us prioritize it along with everything else. Um, if, so that's how that would work along. We would work it and figure out whether as our own people that we had to hire out, we would manage it like any other projects. So that. I also just, I do have the, the language now, uh, not to divert it, but just so people know. So in 2022, uh, we voted to amend the authorization to borrow a sum of money not to exceed 1.185 for highway recreation park and building infrastructure improvements. If amended, proceeds from this bond funding may be used to finance a range of city infrastructure projects, such as a renewable energy system and other in energy efficiency projects at the public works garage, new street lights, traffic lights, and intersection improvements, a retaining wall on Marvin Street, various highway infrastructure projects, and Confluence River Park. So I feel very confident that anything in that list is something we can use the months. So the other than that list, then, so you know, didn't mean to hijack that question, but I, I had two people gave me this <laughs> question within seconds of them. So appreciate thanks, it. Bill. Th you thanks, Bill. Thanks, thanks, Mike, um, for that. Um, now, I'm seeing a couple of people raise their hands who have already spoken. I'm wondering where we are up here on council before I do that. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay, I'll 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 take here from yeah. I'll try to be brief. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, in answer to Councillor Gill's issues, when I spoke about maintenance in my letter, I meant who's going to take care of the place on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis? Who's going to sweep the steps every day? Who's going to empty the trash? Who's going to pick up after people who are partying there and leave stuff behind, if there are people partying there? In conventional high-water events with mud on the lower levels of the place, who's going to sweep that off? Where's it going to go? Who's going to, which city department? has the funding and time to do that. In a big flood event, and we know what comes down river in big flood events, giant logs, toxic sediments, floating propane tanks, who's gonna deal with that? And that those are expensive propositions that we know are gonna occur in the future, beginning with day-to-day -day and then gradually escalating as global climate change catches up with us. That's what I meant. And I hope, I, I don't know if that's what you meant, Councillor, but I hope you think about that as you consider this park. And also remember that we haven't taken care of the, of the places we've got. So that's a, a, that's a kind of a, a concern. Thanks, Steve. Donna. Thank you. Donna Bates, Mom Pity I wanted to feed on Bill's comment on history. Uh, not only did we have that as part of one Taylor Street, but project expanded because of community input. I don't know how many charrettes you had, dozens. I mean, it was huge, the attendance, and people wanted more. They didn't want a simple little park. And so, yes, costs have increased. But the big cost difference to me was the public input wanted a very significant park in that corner. And so I think that's just important to remember. Thanks, Donna. Now, Carrie, Steve, go ahead. I'll be brief too. The examples, uh, the real world examples, the steps that were uh, promised to be removed months ago that floated away from Anna uh, are still sitting up on the riverbank. The silt, the foot of silt in Confluence Park is still there from a year and a half, a year ago. Uh, no one's swept the uh, bike path. The sand and silt is still on the bike path, even though I pointed out that Green Mountain Transit is responsible to have removed that. So th these these are very real issues that we cannot ignore until we let's keep keep this thing alive. But 
let's look at it realistically 10 years out and, and get caught up on some more important things. Thanks, Steve. Okay, Carrie, you I was just recognizing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so so I think I, I um following up on, on the last public comment actually, um in a perfect world where everything worked out exactly the way we want it to, this seems like a lovely idea. And um, if we had the money, if we didn't have to worry about flooding, if we didn't have to worry about people who are currently using it and where would they go and how would their needs be met instead. Um, and so a, a year and a half ago, when we last talked about this, um, or when we talked about it a year and a half ago, uh, I was at that point, I was pretty opposed to continuing on with this and thought we needed to put our resources somewhere else. And that was before the flood in 2023. And and now it just feels like, um, I mean, I'm honestly having a hard time wrapping my head around the idea of putting millions of dollars into building something that um, it, it just doesn't feel realistic right now. Maybe down the road, <laughs> excuse me, at some point, it would be, but um, I don't, uh, it doesn't feel to me like an appropriate priority given what's been happening with our rivers, given what's been happening with our downtown, given what's happening with our taxes, with our financial situation in general. And so I would um, I would like to <clears throat> say we, we gave uh, at a year and a half, the, the amount raised, the fundraising hasn't really significantly changed in the last year and a half. Um, I understand that there are possibly opportunities available in the future, but we did hear that 18 months ago also. Um, I know that's always going to be changing, and I'm not doubting that, but um, but I just feel like right now it's time to step back. I also, um, it, it's gone on for a long time, which I think is important, but also lots of things have changed in that time, and we need to respect that. And I have heard from a lot of people about this for the past two years and the majority of people that I hear from are not in support of this anymore and which doesn't mean that that's representative of the whole city I know but I do hear that a lot also the um the initial bond that passed it was six hundred thousand dollars tucked into a whole lot of other money for a whole lot of other things and and I know when I voted on it I was not thinking yay confluence park I was like well we need all this money to do all of this stuff. And okay, I think the part, I don't know, I don't know what I think about that. And then the second, the second vote was, I would argue more of a vote against Confluence Park, possibly, because it was the vote to to kind of unencumber that six hundred thousand dollars from Confluence Park. And that passed. And I again it was lumped in with other things, and we don't really know exactly what people were thinking when they voted on it. But um it's hard to make an argument that that the public is, has shown with their votes that they're really strongly in favor of this. I can see a way maybe some at some point in the future that this could come back again as its own bond question. If there really is strong public support for it and people want to put our public resources to it, then maybe we have another bond question that's just about this and it's not lumped in with other things and see if that's what people want to do. Um, I, I still have to say I feel... Um, uh, like we have so many other things that we could spend money on. And I realize that it's not a question of $3 million to spend on Confluence Park or on something else. That's really, we're just looking at the 600,000. But the idea that there is $3 million potentially out there that could be raised to to build this park when there isn't $3 million that might be raised to provide temporary housing for people who don't have houses or for, you know, um, public restrooms and trailers for showers or whatever other immediate needs there are. And I know that this is the reality of fundraising is that people are generally more inclined to give money towards something like a park. And that is very disheartening to me, but it is the reality, but I don't think that, that we don't have to, we don't have to go along with that. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, I'm going to see if there are other people on council who have something they need to sell. Yeah. Um, I, I voted against this project the last time we had a vote, and and for all the reasons I've heard to discontinue it tonight, as well as the very eloquent reasons that Carrie just presented, I haven't changed my my mind. I I love the idea of a of a riverfront park. I just 
I just think we're putting the cart before the horse, particularly since the last vote, we've had three three floods. I mean, there are people who lived next to streams for 50 years that suddenly had them in their back porch. Um, a lot has changed in the last 13 or 14 months. Um, we just heard from uh, John Copans about studies that are being done on the watershed and the hydrology of Montpelier. Um, if Mr. Schiff had had already done those studies, they wouldn't be undertaking them now. So we don't know enough about about the river. I, I think. I mean, I, I I think of when I, when I first moved back to Montpelier six or seven years ago, I ran into the the um, what was it called the futures design contest and just about every one of those designs had something on the riverfront a couple of them though included a flood a floodable plain that essentially occupies the entire strip of state parking lots from the north branch to the bailey street bridge um and it just seems that that's where the river wants to go i mean the state doesn't want it to go there but this park just seems to be starting at the wrong end of things. Um, I, I, you know, maybe it, it it's it it probably uh, deserves to be reconsidered in the future. I just think this is the wrong the wrong time for it. Uh, we have many other needs for the fun, for if we're going to bond, we have many other things we we can bond for and need and need to bond for, and that's pretty much where I was 18 months ago. That's where I am now. Thanks, Tom. Tim, I saw your hand up, and then Lauren. I'm on the loop. I, I agree. I also didn't support this last time around. I've been watching since I joined the council, and there have been pretty continuous warrants that we've been paying out for this project, and I've been asking about when we got a chance to talk about it, so here we are. Um, it For all the reasons people, folks have mentioned, it's... I think the resiliency study right now is really key. And I think before we approve anything else in a riverbank in Montpelier, um, we need to get a sense of what the priorities need to be, what we need to be looking at to um, to focus our efforts and our resources to, pro to get Montpelier as well positioned as we can for future events. So just with that alone, I would I would like to unplug this one and, and wait and see what happens. I'm, it's, you know, a lot of thoughts about it. I, I think the it's still struggling with the um, resiliency piece of it and looking at these images and looking at how many giant truckloads of concrete would go into this thing in a, you know, a sensitive riparian zone where I just don't understand how we can call this thing green. Um, it's it's a lovely image, but I, I just don't think it's a good fit. I, I can see a park for the confluence at some point, but something a, a lower impact, maybe up on top. Um, and, and river points of access maybe go to other places where it's easier to access without needing so much concrete and structure to get to it. Because um, I think that's a lot of the reason for the structure is to build the ramps and the steps and all the all the pieces it takes to get get so people can get down there to enjoy the river. So I, I'd love to find once we have the the studies and we know where to go. Um, I don't think it's going to be this location. So, but thanks for all your work and thanks for the work of. The conservancy on you know floodplain issues and resiliency and looking at these dams because I think they are going to be part of the study that comes out that we're going to want to get on and deal with. Thanks, Tim. Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, thanks, Kasha. Like, I mean, this is a project that I was excited about when we started talking about it. I think like the city does need to be thinking creatively and investing in our community and, you know, the reasons Donna laid out, like, I think us not trying to create new things because we're afraid of maintenance costs or other things is just not a good way to be thinking about our community and creating a vibrant community. And, you know, people have brought up that we are changing. So we do need to be looking for different draws and different way to, ways to pull people in. Maybe people are more likely to come downtown and have lunch and spend money at our local restaurants if there's a nice place to gather on the river or, you know, I don't know. But like, obviously I'm hearing the sense of the council right now. I guess a couple of questions. I mean, I, I am thinking part of why I asked John Copans about the River's Edge master plan is like, I do think 
you know, especially, you know, everyone's talking about we're at a different moment. And I do think there might be some more opportunity for uh, working with a state on that whole parcel, you know, all the way like along the rec path. And so how does this incorporate within that? You know, I hope that a lot of the design work that's been done can maybe be usable in the future. And maybe it does become like a piece of that, but we're looking at, I know we've talked at some of the uh, commission on resilience meetings of, you know, putting like benches and other like floodplain restoration stuff and taking the parking lots out, if we could ever work with the state <laughs> to do something like that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to look at that whole stretch. And I do think some of the studies that are coming out are going to be really helpful. I think getting the dams out is critical. And thank you for that work to the River Conservancy. And, you know, like, how does that change the river then? Um, so I, I do think, you know, given the urgency of other pressing community needs paired with a lot that's going on with our rivers, with planning, that putting this on hold, I, you know, I totally get where people are coming from, even though it's frustrating when people are like, nothing ever happens in Montpelier. And like, this is a great example, like people on council change, they, you know, the world changes and here we are again, another project we've invested literally decades in that we're not going to act on. <laughs> so that's frustrating, but, um, but hopefully that, this idea can come back when there's the right time and we've got more information and we've got this, you know, I, I'm hopeful if the River's Edge master plan is useful that there could be a piece that um, that this can come back to life and maybe there's different ways to fund it that rely less on taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, thank you for all the work that's gone into the fundraising to date. Um, so I, you know, I would support the, the request made by VRC, but obviously, there's not support from that from the majority of council right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'll keep looking for ways that, you know, we can continue thinking about the the kind of vision that's been laid out there and how to move that that idea forward of how our community can use the asset of our river with in resilient ways and build build resilience as opposed to kind of viewing it as a threat or a hazard. Thanks, Lauren. Palin, you don't have your hands uh, hand up. You don't have to say anything. Uh, I don't want to. Okay, um, folks, it's, it's very clear where this is going. To me, this is very disappointing because uh, this was really an opportunity to invest in the in the future of the city for something that I think could be uh, could really be a a gem for the city in the future. Um, our our vote last time was to hold hold the money and give the fundraisers a chance to uh, raise the, the money. And I suppose we could just say that the uh, no action was taken. However, I think that uh, for the clarity of everyone, we should have a motion to uh, not go forward. Can I ask a or, question of Kasha? So. Um, the city had allocated 600,000. Is there, like you've talked about that, I I guess I'm not clear on like, is there specific city match required or is like you talked about like the demonstrated commitment could like 50,000 be a demonstrated city commitment that we held over that could help still access those grants or is it like, it has to be 600,000 for some reason? Um, that's a good question. There are multiple ways to demonstrate city commitment. Um, one of those ways is to say, yes, we like, we want a park. And if you show up here with $3 million, we would love to build a park in this community. Um, and that voice of support for the concept can help move the project forward. The other way is financially. And the more that the city has invested in the project, financially, the more that funders see that there's skin in the game and that your commitment is not just something that on paper that's nice to say, but real. And so, yes, if there were a way to hold not 600,000, but 500,000 or 400,000 or whatever that is, any amount will be helpful to, to the whole if this is something that the community would like to continue moving forward with. To that point, I think Carrie, you brought up, you know, how is there potentially $3 million for this? 
And the reality is it's because you have a strong partner. And any of the projects mentioned here tonight, dams, restoration, parks, you will need partners. And if as a city, the way that you treat your partners is to ask them to go above and beyond for this community. And then you decide not to follow through. You will not have partners to work on those projects. And so if there's a way that the city can maintain its commitment in some way of voicing support for the project, retaining some financial support for the project, I can bring you $3 million. I'm here to do that. I want to do that. I can't do it without you. Um, what about the 150000 that we're on the hook for, for design. If the city chooses not to move forward with implementation, the, um, it was the $150,000 was from an LWCF grant, which is for implementation. If the project moves forward to implementation, that grant is glad to pay for design. If the project does not move forward to implementation, that grant is not glad to pay for design. So that's a cost the city has to eat. Oh, sure. So no, that's where the city would have to eat that 150000 if the project is not implemented. Lauren. So I'm wondering if the city holds the 150000 that we have to pay anyway and sets that aside for this project, gives time is, is that an indication where if you know it's that's what we're on the hook for anyway and so is couldn't we just hold that so your them... motion would be to pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars for the design no okay. i think we don't have to pay it we don't necessarily have to pay it, it would be to hold one hundred fifty thousand of the bonding authority as a show of good faith and either that's what the city is committed. We're committing that anyway. So could that end up being used as match as the city commitment towards implementation instead of um, just paying it for a design that we're not using? Mm -hmm. It again, it doesn't. It wouldn't commit us to anything. I think this is just giving till May. The request was yeah. to May to see if more money could be brought in. And in my mind, if we're lowering the taxpayer liability to just what we have to pay anyway, but could actually get a project out of it potentially, then that seems. You'd have $150,000 cost and a project instead of $150,000 cost. I would entertain any motion that someone wants to make. I'll move that we discontinue support for this project and Pay the 150 for design and decide what to do later. I assume we can with the remainder, which is what three three hundred fifty thousand four fifty four fifty. Mm -hmm. That's is there a second? I'll second. I don't know that there's anything more to say that people haven't already said. Um, um, uh, Lena, I'm not going to take your comment now. Thank you for being here. Um, I will uh, take a roll call. Uh, uh, Gil. Um, so my, I'm voting on what am I? Sal's motion to, uh, to, to stop stop the project essentially which means we're on on the hook for $150,000 but we're not uh, keeping it open keeping the rest of the money open as a match of any kind and that's not to say we couldn't consider any future projects right like that's still but maybe not at so, any time in the future anything can happen anything can happen I I don't know I know. I'm sorry. It, it, <laughs> it's so um, 
Oh. Um, could we? I just have a second. I want to think about this. Sorry. Uh, um, um, Terry. I'm having a hard time with this. Um, <laughs> um, I, I would hope that in the future we could revisit various opportunities, but I think for now, I'll vote yes. So, yes. Tim. Yes. Kaylin. Is that a, is that a yes? Or you're? Yes, I was on uh, mute. Yes. Okay. Lauren. No. Adrian. Yes. Okay. Um, Kasha, thank you so much for all the work you've done. That's that's it. Um, I think it's a lost opportunity. Thank you all. Um, we'll take our 10 minute break. Thanks everybody. We are uh, folks. Uh, we are up to item 11, the request for proposals for 12 to 16 Main Street. It's Mike and Josh, mostly Josh. Yeah. All right. Hi, uh, Josh Drum, Community and Economic Development Specialist. Um, this has been a, a project in the works for a few years now. Um, 12 to 16 Main, home uh, right next to the drawing board, next to Shaw's. Um, and the, the city uh, has finished the lot line adjustment to create that parcel. Um, the intention was to do that and for the city to sell it, to get it developed. We're at that point now. Um, and so, you know, before you is a draft RFP um, to see what sort of proposal we want to try to generate. Um, some of the decision points for you is whether or not um, we identify a specific uh, price for the parcel, um, leave it up for the developer to propose a price, um, uh, or identify it for like, you know, whatever you want, whatever sort of qualifications on the development, affordable housing, you know, what process, um, how we're evaluating it, these are the sort of decision points. Um, that are in the RFP that you guys can have flexibility with. So, and could you flag for us what uh, decision, what choices are incorporated in it? Uh, in the proposal? yeah, so the R the RFP is written as uh, as a proposal for the developer to offer a price to us for the council to consider. Right, we've uh, identified the purchase price for the city to to acquire the parcel. I think it's one hundred and thirty four thousand dollars. Right, um, we have also the uh, price that it was appraised at four hundred and forty thousand um, dollars. So those those two uh, evaluations are identified. Um, but again, it's this is structured so that the developer would offer a, a purchase price to the city. You know, obviously based, you know, what they think um, they would be a good value and maybe uh, sort of tied to what we would like to see there, right? Are, do we want housing? What type of housing do we want? Do we want it mixed use? Does that, do the, does the uses um, um, that this council might want to have there uh, adjust the, the price that we're willing to accept? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think basically, you know, the, when the council had talked about this last time and directed us to prepare an RFP, you did say that, you know, housing was top priority, um, but you also wanted to get the 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 um, appraised value. So now we have it. So our thinking was we say, you know, here's here's kind of the different values. If if you want to propose something different but pay more money, you know, I, we you will get to evaluate the results, but you can be as specific as you want. And we've said in here, it's got to be multi-story and should include housing. That would be the most favorable thing. But if somebody says, hey, we'll give you a million dollars and build something else, you know, then you'd have the ability to consider that. Or if somebody wants to set their price and say, I want it for, you know, a low price, but I'm going to put in six stories of 
housing, then we might say, well, that's, you know, it's worth selling it for less to get all that housing. So I think the question is, how do you want to frame that? Or do you want to just let people make proposals and evaluate the proposals? But I think that's, that's what we were trying to create was a situation where people could make us an offer. Here's what I'm going to do. And here's the purchase price. But could, do you want to set a minimum purchase price? Do you want to set a purchase price? You know, those are all things you can do. So. I, I, I think we've had a professional appraisal done. We've got a value. I think we offer for sale at that value. Now, this isn't a market that's afraid to offer more if they feel it's competitive and they or they want to offer more. And certainly there may be folks who offer less, just like in any other piece of real estate to buy or sell. Uh, so I would encourage that we set a price um, that we, I, I think the RFP is a little bit heavy on requirements up front because you're asking for a lot in a pretty short time. Um, you know, I, I, but I, so I think maybe a good way to handle it is put it out there at the 440. Um, and I wouldn't specify what we want. I mean, I really think development is kind of a creative process. There's some art to it. There's some emotion for the developers who are putting a project together with an idea. I think we want to encourage creativity for Montpelier and see what we can bring in. And then we'll have the option to accept or reject any offers. Um, and, and it might be within the offer to kind of shorten the RFP a little and make it not feel as daunting on the front end because you don't want to scare potential developers away, which this could do a little. <laughs> um, might be to have a pre-drawn up purchase and sale agreement, you know, have the city attorney draw it up, have it ready to go, and then have in some of those elements like um, you know, proof of financial ability and some of those pieces built into a contract uh, might be a good way just to have that covered. Because ultimately, whenever a building's built, we've got our 168 pages of zoning code plus the floodplain regs, so what, another 59 or 69 pages on top of that, too, that we're going to have to be able to look at this project and evaluate it and, and decide if it fits. So that would be my suggestion. Anybody else? Terry? Yeah, I think um, I like the idea of of saying what we want and being willing to accept less money to to sell it so that we get what we want um and maybe we would get that if we just you know offered it for the the full assessed value but this doesn't really this isn't really clear about what we want and i understand you're asking us what we want to add in here um so you know for instance if we wanted it to be affordable housing then we could take less money for it and that might make that might incentivize somebody to to buy it and develop affordable housing if they didn't have to pay four hundred and forty thousand dollars for the land um so i so i would like us to think about that or to just you know not have any of this and just say it costs four hundred and forty thousand dollars and and yeah and see what we get so kind of one or the other Adrian. um i'm kind of on the same wave as as tim and you know as i'm not a developer and so i've never responded to an rfp like this to develop a piece of property i was kind of putting myself in their shoes and i've written you know lots of grants and responded to rfps and um i'm just i want to make it easy for developers to do business with us and remove as, as many barriers as possible and when i was going through this I feel like it would be a, like a lot of work, just narratives and and you know collecting as much information up front. But I trust Tim's knowledge of being in the real estate world and knowing that we can put a lot of this into a contract and that we have these policies that are in place to protect us as a city um, as we go through the design build process. And so I would, I don't know, I would love for us to set a price and just kind of open it up to see what we get because. I'd be interested to see what people would design in that weird space. Lauren. Yeah, I, I like the idea of simplifying and allowing creativity. I guess I'm just thinking about, okay, we get a set of proposals. What are we gonna be judging them on? To me, like housing is what we're talking about. So a project that, you know, and maybe there's just a way to say simply like preference will be considered for or however you could word it to just indicate that you know a community goal is increased housing I would love to see something about energy efficiency like I don't think the city should be paying for new fossil fuel infrastructure and you can do that affordably now if you're building up front 
a ton of incentives. Um, so, and maybe it's like a preference thing, like the cities, so that it just gives some indication, like when we're then looking at projects, we're clearly going to be bringing lenses to how we would assess them. So give developers that guidance to like know what we're going to be looking for. Because if they, they might come up with some like awesome retail, really cool thing, but if that's not what we want, then like I don't want them spending a lot of time creating that. So mm -hmm. that would be my, is just like, keep it really simple, but just give some guidance to like, which to me is like housing first and foremost and climate friendly. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I like the adding in the climate friendly part. I think that's really important. I think if we were going to specify housing, we, I would want to see a mix of different kinds of, of housing, some market rates, some, I would like to see some affordable housing in there. Um, and I think that if we're going to, I think we have an opportunity with, we own this piece of land, we can sell it, we can give it away, we can sit on it, we can, you know, all kinds of things. And so we have some power to influence what happens with it. And I, I would like to use that. So, so that I would prefer to have a, an RFP that is saying we want housing, we want mixed kind, mixed housing, um, and we want you know energy resilient and whatever our other specifications are. And then I'm I'm a little hung up on the question about whether we set a price for it or whether we tell people just to offer us whatever you want. Um, I would like to get back the money that we spent on it. That sounds nice, but that's a lot less than the market value. Um, and that this is where I don't I don't know like what's realistic. You know, are people going to be saying, "Oh, if you want affordable housing and you want this and that and the other thing, then I'll buy it from you for a dollar and give you all this other stuff." And it's is that the best? I don't know. So, Jim, two clarifications, Josh. Just so in our zoning code right now, if somebody builds X units, is there a percentage that has to be for affordable within that? Is there some clause that requires you build at least x percent of your units no no there is okay no all right i mean um affordable housing obviously is really expensive in the state of vermont um it's about five hundred thousand dollars a unit um right now right mm -hmm. um and so you know if for market rate you're looking at three hundred and fifty four hundred thousand dollars a unit um you you know that the city of barry has been you know, sold a lot for a dollar. St. Albans has been selling lots for a dollar. Yeah. Winooski has been selling to do affordable housing. So if I'm just, you know, the more money that we are asking for on the lot, the less affordable the housing is going to be. So I think trying to figure out what that mix of housing that you want on that parcel is going to dictate the purchase price feasibility of it if you want all affordable housing but you want four hundred and forty thousand dollars for the lot yeah no that's that might be a, a tough proposition I, so the, the other question i had for you was um the the energy code that one has to build to today i mean just just so you know i think there are standards out there in code yes. you have to build to so it's not i State think standards. anybody building yeah. to build it to today's code is going to be doing probably minimal fossil fuels. They might hitch up to district heat in Montpelier. They might not. Um, they might use heat pumps. No. Uh, and Lauren, I see. There's no district heat there? No. They couldn't do district heat? Oh, you're right. No. Wow. Uh, and, and Josh, have you been uh, in touch with, uh, since we're talking about affordable housing, have you had any communication with, with Downstreet? About this particular parcel? Yeah. I mean, uh, a little bit. It's mostly been on the Country Club Road and some of the other projects that they're working on um, mm -hmm. in town. Um, so not not on this particular parcel itself. They're aware of it. Uh, but like I said, more Country Club Road yeah. and Eaton Street. Because just as we're talking about, if we're talking about affordable housing development in central Vermont, they're basically it. And they've got only, only a certain capacity. I've had some inquiries too, just I think more general inquiries that people wanting to know if they could do something else on the first floor, like whether it's retail or office or something, and then housing up floor. So I think, you know, that given sense. that it's a Main Street, downtown mm -hmm. Main Street, that might be the kind of things that people want to do. I, I've just said, you know, housing is our top priority. We'll see what 
what comes out. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the idea of a mix of housing types. Um, I like the energy stuff. I mean, the, the code still permits fossil fuels and it's just so easy to do um, yeah. non-fossil stuff now particularly at, as new construction compared to what it is for retrofitting. I, I think we ought to include something like that. I do like your idea of putting the, I mean, this does feel like a grant application. I mean, it's, you know, pretty heavy duty and there's like six weeks to do it, right? So I like the idea- You could of, also add more time. You yeah, could add, now, more time. add more time. Like this. Or you could put it, or you could put it in a sales agreement that you know, once we look at the offer, this is the kind of information we're going to be looking for from from uh, the bidder. Um, you know, pricing. I, I mean, I think um, a smart bidder will review the video of this meeting and realize that we'll probably take a dollar for the lot, but. I think what we get for the lot is the least of our worries. We could have actually for this one. Um, Oh, it's the it's the least of my concern because uh, what is built there is, is uh, you know is a long lasting investment so that's what's the most important part. My quick comment too is just in terms of how our processes work because we haven't had a lot of new buildings in town. I think too much specificity, too much you know having a developer try to dance through too many hoops. It basically ends up being designed by committee and you get something that looks like city center, which is exactly why that building looks like it does. Yeah. I, I, I really would hope we would just go out for bids and see what people bring us. Housing is what they're going to do. That's It's what the market's demanding right now. I mean, I, I do think a first floor use that's commercial or different is likely, but I'm not worried about the housing component. We need housing at every level. So it's, the only housing we've really created has been affordable last quite a while there are a lot of people in the middle who need homes too um and there are enough other projects going on right now so this isn't the only one but so i, I would encourage us to be open-minded and uh i do think you should set a price though i, I think it's a fun it's really a flawed and i don't know if you can hear me or not I don't know if I'm in here. I, I can hear you. I don't know if you're being picked up. Is that mic working? It is? Okay. Um, a couple of things. I, I'd like you all to be aware that by when the city, in order to put the bike path through, demolished m, &M it put all of the merchants in a very predict in a predicament. Uh, the, the way that the solid waste recycling law works is that they have to have a designated redemption center to get to, to get an exemption from the bottle law. So right now, most of them are still unaware of it. The article just came out in the, did you, did y'all see the article in the paper last week about redemption centers? Uh, Beverage Baron ceased to be a redemption center in Southbury, I believe. And we, we had lost m and &M. They had to, therefore, because I, I did the lawyer request of the exemption letters for Montpelier, they then that triggered them having to send the cancellation of exemptions to people who who are around Barry. So there is no redemption center in Montpelier at all, and all the merchants are legally required to take back the size and brands of what they sell. And they're all, I mean, Sitco is saying, "I'll go out of business before I'll start doing that," and he's the one who sells all the jumbos, the uh, the jumbo beers to the people that drink it for breakfast. Uh, but my point is that possibly uh, some some things to consider in the RFP, a preference for uh, affordable yet still on the tax list. I don't want to have Downstreet build something there and not pay taxes on it. And secondly, a redemption center is an essential need. Otherwise, you're going to saddle this community, every merchant, down to the state house cafeteria and capital stationers. I've, I've gone and done the inventory of everybody who has to start taking their cans back, the hardware store, et cetera, et cetera. It's a mess. So we have some obligation. I did a request and the city didn't even consider this before they abolished the M&M. &M.
Um, all right. I, I, I think that uh, one of the things we're looking for is a lot of flexibility for the city because although Tim's right, you know, the market is telling us we uh, housing is needed, but we don't know what a proposal is going to look like. And I, I think that we want to be able to give people a chance to come to us and with an, with an interesting idea and let us say, yeah, go for it. Um, so that militates argues in favor of adding flexibility to this system and probably taking out some of the detail from the uh, from the RFP. It would be helpful if that was identified because I feel like this is pretty flexible. Excuse me, Josh. Did, did, did you Steve's either converse out in the hallway or not here? Because you it's we can hear you up here, both Steve's. Oh, no. um, All right. So we can hear you up here and it's kind of difficult to concentrate. So if you have you if you would like to participate in the meeting, great. If you want to have a conversation, please no, thank you. Thanks, Bill. I feel like this is pretty flexible. So if there are um requirements that are identified in here that you want me to eliminate because you think they would be burdensome, that'd be great. Please, I'd like that feedback. Certainly the application timeline. Um, we're, we're sort of early enough in uh, the year where we can extend that. That's not an issue. Um, and I think, I don't know how many development RFPs everybody has reviewed. This is pretty scaled down version of a lot that I've read. Um, but if there's sections in here, you know, I, I you want me to re remove because you think it doesn't create flexibility, please. Yeah, that's that's a critical feedback for sure. Yeah, and I I the number of RFPs like this that I've reviewed is zero. So I'm happy happy to rely on other people's expertise. I have no expertise. I've reviewed one now. Essentially, at this one, but I also thought it was extremely flexible and open, and not very, um, not very onerous. But that then I'm definitely coming from a, a world of applying for grants and where there's you know lots of specificity. The timeline definitely is short, um, but I would rather put in stronger language about what we would like to see. Say a mix of housing, you know, housing is is primary we already have that in there but that it's a, a mix of different kinds of housing and um and i'm and i mean i'm leaning towards not having a price on it and just seeing what people will offer us for the ability to um to do something creative and different but i i don't know if that's a smart business decision so i'm i'm i'm, I'm not going to be arguing for that exactly um i do have a question though about um up in uh, section, okay, sorry. Okay, so section three, where it says the opportunity and it has factors for consideration. So it says no Act 250 permit required um, for priority housing projects, no minimum parking, et cetera, et cetera. And then it says tax stabilization policy, allowing for a base incentive of 50% reduction of municipal taxes on the increment created as a result of the development over five years. City council must approve. So that's a TIF, right? No, it's not TIF. Okay, so tell me more about what that actually is. Well, we we actually have a tax stabilization policy, mm -hmm. um, and and so this is a quick summary of it. Um, that that policy does provide an incentive for developers. Um, so if if a developer was coming to and want to have a project proposed, they come in for tax stabilization. Uh, Council has the ability to approve um, an increment of stabilization okay. for the project. So uh, right now the lot's undeveloped, right? Theoretically, it's uh, assessed at four hundred or appraised at four hundred forty thousand um, dollars. If somebody had a tax stabilization policy and they were to develop a building that would be assessed at one point five million dollars, fifty percent of that increment the, of the increase mm -hmm. would be stabilized over a period of time. In this case, the base is five years. Okay. So that's something that 
might be available to them yes. if we were to approve it in the future. And we might be inclined, more inclined to do that perhaps if the project looked more like what we want it to look like. And so maybe they have to spend more building more affordable units or they have to spend more doing something. And then in exchange, they might hope that they get this. We have a tax stabilization and policy which yeah. kind of spells out what, yeah. what you have to do, like the, the kinds of things we want to. Right. And then similarly, we might, there's something here about we might enter into a development agreement with them. Um, so maybe would that be part of a proposal that they might make to us? Do you think or could, although I, you know, there's not a lot of public infrastructure. No, and I, and I'm, I'm yeah, okay. the development. So we have we have our development agreement policy, but just yeah. like in a development agreement in general between you know the city, we're we're selling this parcel, we're having a development agreement. They're going to they're promising us to 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 build X that you've approved, right? So that's that that's what I'm talking about with the, that development agreement. Yeah, okay, a little right, bit different because right. it is a little different. I mean. You know, do, if we just put it on the market for whatever price and someone bought it, you know, they could, I think in our case, we want to make sure there's some surety they're actually going to do right. what they tell us they're going to do as opposed to, well, I bought the land, it's mine now, I'm, I can do whatever I want, or I'm just going to sit on it. So that's, it's that kind of development agreement, right. which is, you know, you're, we sold it, you know, especially if it's less than market value, right? We gave it to you at a discounted price because you were going to do X. And then they're like, well, yeah, you know, I couldn't. Don't really want to do it. So we have to make sure there's some clawback or some some teeth in it to, you know, if that's the deal, that's yep. the deal. So what else? I it, I gather that people are not willing to just sign off and say yeah do this now although it seems like you know i i agree there's a lot there's a lot of flexibility here because and everything every every offer comes to the council and we either approve it or not so that gives us like the ultimate discretion and control yeah who incurs the cost of the contaminated soils it's not clear from reading subject Section two, it says there's a plan, but it doesn't say who's going to pay for the contaminated soil. The the contaminated soils that we already have a corrective action plan. Um, the SMAC letter is actually in draft form with the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and actually that they should be signing that fairly quickly. Um, the SMAC letter is site management action um, uh, certification. I think that's what it is. So the, the 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 contaminated soils, I I believe based on the um, uh, the map that I saw are underneath the pavement and are outside of this parcel. So the site won't actually be disturbed um, based on my review of the map, the map. So nothing's going to have to be done to them. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I mean, so we've informed DEC that we in, are intending to go through an RFP for changing the use. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. um, so they're aware. They're very thankful. Um, and that the next step would be when a developer um, is chosen, that they just need to be informed that, you know, there's there's this contaminated site. Here's the here's the locations. You can't disturb it. But again, in this case, the I, the locations appear to be outside of this parcel underneath pavement that we own. So that wouldn't be disturbed soils for the development. And the disturbing of the soil is what would trigger a requirement for well, some kind of for this type For this particular site, they just have to come up with a, a, a management plan and how they would um, protect their workers and how, it, how would they would uh, handle the soils. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tim. It's very difficult. A downtown site with dirty dirt, or right? Whatever they call it, it's almost every site you build in the old developed area is going to have it. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, they found five underground storage tanks when they yeah. did this. 
<laughs> so actually it's a, it's a value added that you've taken this step and done it in addition to all the other things that have happened over the last several years to make it a better viable yeah. site so i wouldn't get hung up on what we paid for we've done a lot of investment in this site as a city to make it a, a better and a viable site for something good to happen and tim you see this as a as an attractive spot for for an investor i do and I think it's one of the highest elevation downtown spots, if you think about it, kind of like Confluence Park area. Um, you know, they're both very high. It's one of the areas in the floods that didn't flood. It's it's mm -hmm. high. And so actually the building that was designed back when when it was looked at when m m went out, uh, I was really impressed from the first glance at those plans that it really fit right in and didn't look like it was like jacked up. It, 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 you can put a really nice building there that fits in and fits the streetscape and still is up, you know, above design elevation and will meet the standards. And there are not that many locations in downtown. Very few. So we have a, a we have uh, some choices here, including either to approve this RFP as it is, or to ask for some changes. And I don't know what those changes would be. But what I've heard is uh, one, maybe name a price. Two more uh more detail about housing I, I would just want to have something that that says we want a mix of different kinds of housing you know different sizes of units different different costs not necessarily more specific than that but that's a, it's, a, it's a mix so it's not all luxury high-end condos and it's not all affordable either the mix that that's personally what i'd like to see Okay. Uh, so. I think the housing committee has come up with language that we coach them on uh, from the energy committee on um, exceeding the exceeding the code. There are the the code actually describes um, specific approaches to exceeding their code, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so there's there's language that the housing committee has that you might review that would indicate um, what Lauren was talking about, fossil fuel, but actually going above what's permitted by even the uh, highest level of the existing energy code. Yeah, Lauren, I thought I saw you shaking your head, head about someone would be required to do a non-fossil fuel development based on our current code. Or current zoning. Yeah, I mean, Sal spoke to it. You could definitely still put in fossil fuels under the current energy code. So I think if we're trying to indicate um, that we want this to be, you know, I mean, you should be putting in heat pumps or whatever at this point. There's so many options that are affordable and avoid the fossil fuels. So, um, so I think indicating that and it might be like a simple way to reference and if people wanted more, like if an applicant wanted more clarity on what do we mean, you could point them to it or something just, just to the point of keeping it simple and not adding like a whole long section or even just like climate friendly design or something. And then we could look at what they come out with um, just, just to indicate that that's something we'll be thinking about when we look at it. So they are aware of that. Like do we encourage and, and uh... Mm -hmm. Evolving concepts, we'd love to see them. Yeah. yeah. So the code also doesn't the energy code also require um, charging stations when you get to a certain density? There's no parking with it. So that's what I'm wondering if if there's no parking requirements, are we including chargers within that? Because I think that's maybe wrong. We have to. We should check that to see if. If code does require charging stations, and maybe we want charging stations, but um, it, it we do. But if, the price. but if there's no parking, to it's develop. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could have a couple of find a place to put a dumpster. Say nothing about parking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's. Yeah, I think that's something to consider too. I mean, I think all I, I, this doesn't speak against any of the ideas, but I think in terms of, you know, it is a pretty limited. I mean, it's great location. But the site is got a funky shape and it's small, and you know there there was an approved building on it which actually had a, a redemption center on the first floor and I think it was offices on the upper floors at the time, so that there is a design people can work for, um, from or at least use as reference. But you know it probably isn't going to be more than 
three or four stories just given downtown and i think once you get above three you got elevator you're wrong bill but i think it's got to be more than three just to pay for the oh elevator. well that maybe i mean the cost yeah. of one of those babies yeah that's true <laughs> well yeah. so i think so but i get what i'm really trying to get at is i don't know how many units there just will be so i think that's something we probably need to wait and see like how many you can really get in there i don't know you know maybe if you went four or five stories you could get two units per story i don't know it's a tight spot maybe three that it depends how big depends they are the size, right? yeah yep. so that's it yeah you need an architect right no no i know that's what i mean that's just i'm saying so i think we we're all picturing maybe a 40 unit building and it's going to be maybe a eight it's unit not building be or something so right well i remember the idea that someone had years ago of Putting a 14 story building on that site. To, no, it was beside the old was, country store site. That, was it? That it was, but it was going to be one for every county. For some reason, they thought that made sense. But the, show base. But I don't think it's going to be 14 stories. No. Yep. Well, our zoning allows six, right? Lauren. It's a max. Um, yeah, I guess I've just, I've been kind of wondering with Carrie's suggestion of preference for mixed income i i have been wondering if that's a pretty small site like it might be that you could get more units that are all like middle income housing yeah. than if you're having to do different sizes so just to like the creativity and like maximizing units might be more my goal than like number of units i mean ideally not like million dollar condos or something but so maybe there's some indication of addressing affordable and moderate priced housing or something, some indication of that. But I don't know, just the more flexible we could do it with an indication that housing, and then we'll be able to look at the proposals, I feel like would be my inclination on the housing piece. And, and, then, and then flexible, sorry. No, go and ahead, then just like, going. I think it's just general nod to the climate stuff without going into the energy code, because now that Sal's talking about it, like I just remember being very detailed and I don't know that every aspect it will be relevant to this building. So I don't want people to get overwhelmed and really we just want them to be hopefully putting a proposal together that's but but to clear on whatever be clear on what everyone's thinking nobody's saying that any particular item we put in here is going to be uh something you must meet this or you don't get approval it's all here's a list of things that we're all in, that we're interested in seeing and these are things that we will consider in evaluating any proposal. It, it does say in the evaluation criteria, ability to maximize development potential for the creation of housing as one of the, mm -hmm. yeah. one of our eva evaluation criteria. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, developers, like, they love doing projects because, you know, that's how they make money. So they'll figure out a way to get what we want and they will get what they want, mm -hmm. right? So we can eliminate the statement of understanding. <laughs> we know what they want. Right? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, we ask them to, to talk about why they want the project. I mean, let's, we know why they want the project. It's why we want the project that is important. So can they satisfy what we want? Understood. I guess the, the question is, do you just, would you like us to bring back a revised draft or do you want us to just go ahead and issue something that meet, meets what you said? Or, you know, I mean, I, we do have some time and we just wanted to get, this has been pending and it was, we wanted to get this moving. Mm -hmm. So, cause we, we should. Laura. I feel like, I mean, maybe even the housing language that's in there is fine. Again, adding something of climate friendly design. I guess the last lingering question to me is, do we put a price? And I would really lean heavily on Tim's advice on that one personally. I just think you need to guide the market. So you, what are you suggesting? That the assess value? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the 440. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is so outside my, my zone of you know, knowledge at all, but it's very interesting and I'm, I'm learning, I'm thinking hard about this. Um, 
And so it may be that the way it's written is flexible enough, is directive enough. Um, and, and I'm just thinking about what I don't want to have happen is that we sell it for a reduced rate and we get more housing, which is great, and a whole lot of profit for whoever developed it um, and nothing in particular extra for us. You know, so if we're going to sell it for less than market value, I want us to really get something for it. So it doesn't it doesn't seem like we're leaning towards being super, super directive and prescriptive in what we're asking for. And so then it's, it doesn't feel like a great exchange to sell it for a lower price. So if we want to put it, so, so I'm, I'm easily persuaded to go with the 440 in exchange for not being super directive in the RFP. What, what do other people think about I don't know that question uh, yeah I, I don't know the answer for sure either but Lauren I don't have the right phrase in front of me where um but just thinking of the housing piece I wonder if we put in something like um sorry I should find it ability to maximize development potential for the creation of creation of housing um like in including the need for more affordable housing or something like just something to indicate like that if we're going to give that preference that might even influence what we would accept for a kind of overall development agreement that that's something we'd be looking favorable otherwise that's not indicated in here at all so maybe that like affordable or mixed use housing like the addressing the need for affordable or mixed income housing however you had said it just I'm just like, again, like if we if we have in our heads ways we're going to judge this, like I'd rather people just know when they're trying to be creative about how to address what we're looking for. So if I'm going to come in and ask to buy it for less than the asking price. What am I proposing that's going to make you want to sell? Yep. Sell it to me for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just thinking like, what are we going to get out of this? In the end, it's if we create it properly, it'll generate tax revenue. Um, and a building in that league will be more than $50,000 a year um, easily right now. Plus, you're going to have water and sewer rate um, pieces. So it'll generate more than 10000 a year in income for the city as an ongoing piece and going up every year, as we know. Um, mm -hmm. But so I think that's a plus. But, but I think just keeping it, housing focus if you want to i'm trying to think if we do i'd move that we offered at four hundred forty thousand. that you just maybe modify the rfp a little to include the energy efficiency preferences preference toward mixed use housing and uh, obviously we'll look favorably upon you know income sensitive housing units um, and then just let's get it going right Timeline? Do you guys want to adjust the timeline? You got to move that out? out. I mean, you know it. It's like even for somebody to tell you a timeline they can build right now. I mean, I've been calling builders on a few things, and I got a first one I called told me September of twenty six. I mean, it's well, this doesn't prescribe when they can start. Mm -hmm. This just prescribes when the RFP should be due and the, and the decisions you wanted by that. council, not for when it's supposed to be started. anticipated construction date and milestones. If they're supposed to until tenancy where what page is that um it's under project approach isn't it or yeah project approach like fourth bullet page four mm -hmm. so it's just asking for so what their page for that's just that's them saying when they can start when they're proposing the development to start yeah not the same way as it it's a it's a variable that you might use to decide, oh, they're not going to start it for three years, but this one is going to start in 18 months. Yep. And then you've got to judge who's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, and in thinking about in terms of what the city's getting out of it, we paid 134 for it. If we get 440 for it. We also get that three hundred thousand. Just another money question because we're bouncing here. Um, was there an amount of money that we had to reimburse 
the state that had that, something? That's what the 134 was. That's the 134. So that's not our acquisition cost, is it? That's the penalty we have to reimburse? Um, wasn't the penalty. We They bought the money. They bought the lot as part, part of, you know, we'd paid our share of all, all the acquisitions. Right. So we, we may have had a, a smaller share. So that was their share. Or once they determined that that was not necessary for the project, they could reserve it for transportation use or we could buy out their interest. And so the residual interest was the 134,000 and we reached an agreement with them to pay it over two years. So we, paid we bought three properties, right? Right. But we, but we also bought the car a lot and we bought we look, it was it was in part of all of those. But, but for this site, the three properties were the old Fisherman's Galley, yep, the, yep, the, yep. the Tamathi all, Block, all and the M&M, &M, right. and that's part of this. Yes. Yeah. So I have to look and see what our share was for that purchase, because there was we did a federal grant that we, that we purchased those properties through the federal grant, and then this was declared surplus to the project, and so we we had to pay to have 100% rights to that. So it might be a little bit more. I think I have, I have checked But that. we've already paid that. We've already paid it, but it's just in terms yeah. of what we get back. But you're really yep. not making that much money when you no. get the end of 440. <laughs> no, making it's, some, it's good. But yeah. Not. OK. Well, what it does mean. Yes. Is, is everybody happy with this? Do we need a motion or do you want to just Tim made, it. Tim made it and uh, I don't know if the clerk was able to track the motion uh, to move uh, to offer it 440k and to modify the RFP towards efficiency and mixed income housing. Is that it? Yeah. As, as Tim was going on, it, it, he well wrapped up with and let's get this going. And I was wondering, well, are those words part of the motion? <laughs> no, no, no. I, think, I think I got the key that there wasn't a second. There wasn't a second yet. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, let's get this going. All right, we're Thank up you. to, thanks, Josh. We're up to item 12, responsible contractor ordinance. I'm sorry? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we're still going. I'm still seeing it on my screen. The screen for a second, so I put it back. All right. Hi, I'm Kurt Modica, um, Public Works Director. Uh, before I start on the responsible employer ordinance, I just wanted to address one of the public comments earlier about uh, School Street. Um, so School Street is, um, and all the neighboring streets, a very old water system, one of our many very old water systems in town. And um, you know, prior to the project, we did clean out all the valves, um, and um, and we shut all the appropriate valves. They just did not do not hold pressure, which we um, we're aware of because we've had so many leaks on School Street that these valves have been used many many times, and our staff has always had to fix things with water flowing. Um, so, uh, I don't think the contractor was used to that, that to having to work on, with some pressure still on the system. Um, and so there was some pushback. Um, uh, we have not agreed to any additional cost, um, for that delay. It did, it did delay the project for one day. Um, but, uh, there has been no, no commitment for extra cost to the contractor at this point. And the next day when they did it, it was still under pressure. The same valves were used <clears throat> and they were able to do the work. Thanks, Kurt. Just want to make that clarification. Before you get started up, what I'll say, I'll say at this point the same thing I said at the beginning of the uh, Confluence Park uh, discussion, which is that we've received a number of uh, emails from 
people on both sides of this issue. And so I appreciate all the uh, comments and emails that people have sent us. You're on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I just want to start by sort of laying the groundwork of where um, where the city is at. Uh, you've seen a lot of things coming to council from staff uh, with regard to improving the tax base with uh, reducing costs. Um, we've modified our purchasing policy to make things more flexible for us um, in saving money. We were able to save nearly $100,000 on School Street as a result of that change, but it also brought us up into compliance with um, uh, with federal requirements. Uh, we've had the development agreement that staff proposed to try to spur a, a larger tax base and get um, some of these projects going. And um, tonight, I want to talk to you about the responsible employer ordinance and its financial impacts on uh, on the ability to do infrastructure projects. Um, but before I get into that, just want to uh, remind council of our, our last budget. Um, we really cut everything out of the operational budget to the core, including one of um, one of the public works staff members. And um, and there's really not much left to come out of the operating budget. We made a we made a conscious decision to really try to put as much into capital as we could. Um, that resulted in about six hundred fifty thousand dollars of paving, which is roughly half of what we need to sort of maintain steady state. We also have had to ref, uh, defer a lot of our equipment purchases, so we've got a real backlog of equipment that needs to be replaced, and our maintenance costs is, is really going up quickly. Um, we didn't put any money in for storm stormwater funding and no sidewalk money. So um, there's a, a ton of needs um, in the infrastructure in the city, and uh, and I'm just nervous. I'm nervous that that we're not going to be able to fix things fast enough. Um, like School Street, there's so many valves in the system um, that don't work, and it makes things it makes it challenging to um, to fix leaks to maintain the system. We get sinkholes all over the place from old metal culverts that are sinking in. So it's just there's a massive need, and um, and this ordinance has an impact on how much infrastructure the city can replace uh, financially. Um, we also have some things coming up in the next budget. Um, you know, there's a number of HMGP projects um, that some of the earlier presenters talked about. We've got Elm Street, Deerfield, Lower State Street, North Street. Uh, Dickey's Dam and um, the Dog River Road elevation for the wastewater plant. Those those projects um, they are funded if the um, if the benefit cost analysis comes back favorable, so that the investment you make in that work is is um, less cost than the recurring damages. If it's not, they won't fund that, and that's going to be on the city to fund. Uh, we also have the stump dump. I don't know what the future is of the stump dump. We're we have a contractor, a uh, consultant um, under contract to work on that design, but that could be a really um, potentially expensive um, replacement for the city. And um, and we really need it for maintenance. We don't have anywhere else to put catch basin cleaning or street sweeping or anything. So it's kind of, it's critical for maintaining our permits for operations of the city. Um, so based on on School Street, and then I will admit I don't have a ton of data, um, but I do have one project where I've had a lot of discussions with the contractor. Um, one of where we're looking at, what I estimate is about a ten percent cost increase for uh, construction projects, um, for the responsible employer ordinance, and that's not just the change in wages, but it's also the administrative component of you know, making sure that they're complying with um, the requirements of the ordinance. Um, so I, with that said, I just, um, I wanted to, I wanted council to consider a temporary waiver of the ordinance as we work through flood recovery. There are so many projects in the queue and so many unknowns in the future uh, and so many needs. There's, I hear um, so often from residents how much they pay in taxes and how poor their street is. Um, and um, and with the budget challenges we're facing and all the cuts that we've already made um, and not really anywhere else to cut, um, I just, I think it, I just wanted to make the recommendation for council to consider a two year suspension of the ordinance to help us through flood recovery. If that's not something council wants to consider, then 
um, I have a proposal uh, for proposed changes within the ordinance to make it more effective. Uh, the second issue with the ordinance, um, aside from the construction cost increase, is the way it's structured. We have no way of verifying that contractors are complying with it. Um, all they do is, is sign a, a certification that they're going to comply with it. And we don't have any certified payroll. We don't have any audit mechanism. Um, so we don't know if it's if it's actually working, if people are getting, if their employees that are doing the work are getting paid um, the state wage rates. So I, I was, b before I go into the specific changes that um, we've laid out here, I first wanted to have council, you know, discuss the, the initial uh, concept of a temporary suspension of the ordinance. And uh, I'll stop there for a minute. Very. Um, I have a question about um, the wages that the city pays to the city employees and um, our public works employees getting paid prevailing wages. Or, would, or are we possibly ending up in a situation where our contractors are getting paid more than our city staff? Yeah, so it's sort it's of a compl work. complicated because um, each task, um, you know, what depends on the type of work you're doing on how much you get paid. So if you're doing concrete work, you get one rate. If you're doing pipe work installation, you're doing another. If you're flagging, you get another. And our, our staff does all of those things. So I would think there's probably instances where they are getting paid that and so probably instances where they're not. And you get the full benefit package. Yeah, there, but benefits on okay. state wage rates are also part of the requirements. So it's a 42 percent uh, fringe benefit, they call it, that's required in addition to the rates. But our employees are just where if you're out, out on a job working for a construction company, you may be getting paid at three different rates on the same day based on the work you're doing but our employees are just getting paid based on a, uh, the collective bargaining agreement. That's correct. Gotcha. So. Or can you put a dollar figure on that 10% over the two years? I mean, it depends on how many construction projects we advance. I can give you an example. Um, the, the large bond we have through USDA for the wastewater plant um, biosolids project and East State Street, that's funded together. Um, through USDA, which does not have any wage rate requirements. So this ordinance would apply in that case. That's tw about 24 million. So that would be roughly a quarter million cost to add for those two projects. Lauren. Uh, just a couple of questions. When you're kind of going through the long list of like upcoming projects, how many of those do you think would be triggered by the two hundred or three hundred thousand? Just to get a sense of scope of, because I thought it was like not very many that we've done recently have actually triggered this till School Street. Um, yeah, we, we did. So I would say the majority of the of the flood recovery projects this would be triggered under because um, FEMA does not have wage rates. So the only Wage rates um, through funding requirements are, are the state loan program, so the state revolving loan funds. Um, they have Davis-Bacon rates, which is not what our ordinance has, but um, it's a similar concept. And um, uh, the ARPA funds also have um, Davis-Bacon rates associated with them. But none of the FEMA projects, none of the HMG pre projects have wage rates. So all of those, all of the 44, um, FEMA recovery projects and all of the HMGP projects, which I don't know exact number, probably a dozen or so of those, this would apply to. So it's a pretty significant amount. Are are we able to get reimbursed for that, or do we? Like, aren't those re, we're getting so, reimbursed yeah. for FEMA? Or are they not going to? They'll, they'll only pay a certain amount for labor. Um. So, FEMA, there's the match, which. So that would be the increase for the city. HMGP um, <clears throat> this round, uh, if we get to construction, would be 100%. Um, but those those projects that we are not able to fund through the benefit cost analysis have the potential to be fully funded by the city. 
um, you know, if that doesn't get through that, it doesn't qualify financially through HMGP. I'll get to you, folks. So, uh, to be clear, twenty-four million ten percent is two point four million dollars. Oh, yeah. Sorry, right? I did my math. I missed a decimal on that. Two point four million dollars paid above and beyond what we would ordinarily pay due to this ordinance. That's right. Over two years. <laughs> on, on how many projects? Two two projects. On two projects. East State Street. They are big projects. They're granted. big projects, yeah. Well, some of the biggest we've done. Um, Kurt, I know this is where you had expressed a desire to limit the first part of the discussion to one question, which clearly, is, that's not the way it's going. People are asking all kinds of questions. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing. Uh, which is um, if I've, I've been hearing people say, well, we shouldn't water down the protections that we have in our current uh, responsible employer ordinance. And then, uh, but the proposed amendment to the ordinance is to, instead of having a standard of uh, the standard we have under the ordinance is to do uh, a D Davis Bacon standard. And I wonder if you or if anyone can tell us what the impact of that would be on us as the contractor and what the impact would be on on the workers. Or would we, is it reasonable to say that the workers would be getting screwed if they if we move go from our ordinance to uh, Davis Bacon standard, or or what? Does anyone know the answer to that? Well, again, it's a moving target. So um, these rates change every year based on uh, a survey. So for our current ordinance, which is the state prevailing wage rates, um, they survey or contractors and what they're paying um, for three different regions in Vermont. Uh, so the uh, southern, northern, and Chittenden County are basically basically the three regions. So it depends on on the economic climate in those areas and um, and what that what the, how those results come back. And it's um, and for the Davis Bacon rates, it's federal, so it's a national average. Um, I think there are some that go both ways. I would say probably in general the Davis Bacon rates are slightly less, um, but it's not a hundred percent. Uh, in that category. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, I didn't do a lot of infrastructure work when I was in the construction biz, but I know I I shied away from Davis Bacon jobs because it it was a burden to to me as a contractor to have to do all the record keeping and and change my payroll and all that stuff just wasn't worth it. And a, and a $300,000 project is well within the capability of a very small uh, excavating, plumbing, you know, HVAC, whatever type company. And I think we'd be, I think a lot of those guys, particularly in this climate where there's work all over the place, which, which actually bodes well for their workforce, um, who I think are getting top dollar because they're hard to find. Um, I think we'd miss out on a lot of um, a lot of contractors just simply wouldn't bid on the projects because it's it's too much trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about the kind of record keeping we're asking them to do and, you know, it, it doesn't spe it talks about fringe benefits or, or cash value, but it doesn't explain what those benefits are and how you determine the cash. I mean, it's it's just very hard to enforce, even if we even if we had that list of numbers, you know, we still need the sole compliance infrastructure uh, to, you know, to figure it out. So kind of shooting ourselves in the foot, you know, one toe at a time here uh, with this, I think. A two, you know, a two year hiatus, um, particularly given these 
incredibly large projects. I mean, $2.4 million is a very big chunk of change. Uh, and having gone through now a budget process, I don't, I don't have any any qualms at all about waiving this. If I, I thought though there was some that we we couldn't actually waive or waive a an ordinance, we had to suspend well, it or this convert it to a policy or yeah. I think I think the plan here right now is that we were having this discussion to see what people wanted to do, get a mm -hmm. sense of where we go. If, if we want to keep things, then we'll just keep the things. If you were to you know, if we need to actually amend the ordinance or waive it, then we would put it on for our readings and go through the formal process. To this, the, the, it had come up earlier and the request was, let's put it on a council meeting for discussion. So this is really getting a sense of where we'd like to go and then we work out. So we, we can't really do it tonight. You can just say, this is how we'd like to see. You. This is what we'd like to see okay. and come up for. Mm -hmm. Because to do a, a waiver suspension would essentially, would essentially require an amendment to the ordinance. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. an ordinance override. We remember we did that. We we did that with our park lit ordinance. We suspended the existing ordinance, put in a substitute ordinance for two years. In a period. Because of, yeah, Lauren, and we still went through the process. Well, I was going to say I definitely, but it sounds like so we're saying. We would need public hearings or we would need to, our, to do the normal adoption. okay okay just just because like we spent a long time on this when we adopted it and there were like to just not hear the case for why we did it not get any information like i wouldn't like i don't know that it's 2.4 million for because maybe there's like a lot of equipment and it's less labor or so i just feel like there's a lot of like numbers being thrown around that i i, I is it really this like incremental increase when you know people are getting paid really well right now because of the shortage in the labor market. Are people really getting paid that much less? Like, I just find it frankly hard to believe that there's like that big a difference that we would. So anyway, I just feel like I would want more information. And we did this based on a set of values as a community that I would just, yeah. Like, so I think at a public hearing, we could hear the case for why, um, why we even adopted this in the first place, which I think is valuable to hear. And then, you know, I, it's totally reasonable to bring this proposal forward and say, you know, we had a massive flood and maybe we want to, you know, expedite some projects, but we're doing it, you know, at the cost of, you know, a value that we held of people working in our city on big projects should be getting a livable wage. And so I would just okay. look forward to having a fuller conversation than making, so I'm glad we're not making any decisions tonight. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely not. Yeah, Fair. that would, that would definitely be the process and, and, you know, to, you know, sort of provide some support for Kurt here is, you know, we're feeling just an enormous amount of pressure to get the work done and to stretch dollars as far as we can. And we're, you know, we're looking everywhere we can. And so, you know, this is your policy, right? We're taking our tax, our local tax dollars and we're investing them out however we think is appropriate. And, you know, Kurt's being charged with getting every last foot of pavement and every last foot of pipe. And, and so, you know, we're trying to, we're saying, you know, we, we're, we're looking everywhere, you know, we're, you, mm -hmm. so uh, that, that's where we're at. Uh, but obviously it's, you, it is your choice and you all adopted it for the reasons you adopted it. And that's great. And we're not, we're, we're calling something to your attention, just like that's what you pay us. Yep. So. Carrie. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm hoping we can, we can not talk about this again and. <laughs> Just be done with it tonight. That would be my preference. Um, this is the third time we've talked about it and we keep saying, we're only talking about whether we're gonna keep talking about it. So I'm done talking about it. Um, but if we bring it back the next time I want it to be with some action attached to it. I don't wanna have another conversation where we're gonna talk about, maybe we're gonna talk about it. And I think we need to be really clear that what we are considering, what, what's being, what we are being asked to consider is to uh, try to save the city some money by paying people less for their work. So let's just just be really clear about that. And if that's, I mean, I don't think you're you're trying not to be clear about that, but I just think the public needs to understand that 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 we have this ordinance because we have values that said we think that people should get paid a prevailing wage for their work. And now we're saying we're or we're considering the idea that it's too expensive actually. So we were only interested in paying 
and paying people a prevailing wage when we felt like we could afford it. And now we don't, so we're going to pay less. And that's not a value that I'm comfortable with. I'm also really interested in a more definitive answer to the question of whether our own city employees are getting paid prevailing wages. Because if they're not, then this ordinance is completely pointless and should be done away with entirely until we can get that part sorted out. I saw a couple of hands in the room, so I want to get them. Steve? which I always say is where the potholes live. And I have a vested interest, I think, in seeing infrastructure projects go forward as, as expeditiously as possible. I'm kind of new to this um, issue, but I understand that, or anecdotally, I've heard that some contractors choose not to bid on jobs in Montpelier because of this ordinance. And I wonder, Sal kind of touched on this a minute ago, but Kurt, I wonder, do you have any direct uh, knowledge that, that we are not getting a, a wide range of, of bids because of the ordinance? I mean, I, I can't say that for with certainty. Uh, I can say with School Street, we got only one bid. Ah, okay. Um, that may be a subject to look into. I do um, support the, the staff's recommendation to move this forward to, a, I guess, to an actionable item. Um, I understand Councilor Brown's concerns and Councilor Howard's, but I think that a, a public discussion and a full airing of the issue at this point in the in the wake of the uh, the floods and the, the horrendous issues that we're facing makes sense. And at that point, both all sides can be heard and we can, as Councilor Brown recommended, take final action so we're not just sitting around yakking about it all the time. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, uh, Lisa. Lisa, it's the same street yeah. um, where we uh, don't have enough potholes. Yeah. I appreciate if you could. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to second what Sal's saying. I have way more experience this year with contractors than I ever intended on having. And I can tell you absolutely this comes up immediately, every single one. And the first question is, do we have to pay the bacon wages? Do you understand? And I had to look up what bacon wages were because I had no, I mean, just the phrase was so unusual to me. And what I'm hearing over and over and over again is contractors being like, oh, no, then I'm not even bidding on the project. Just this morning, Mike Miller sat with me. Well, a contractor looked at me and said, wait a second, you have to understand. And I recognize he's throwing out numbers here, but I'm surprised to hear you say it's only 10%. Because he was like, look, a contract that's $100,000, you add this to it, I'm adding 150 to 175 would be the total cost of that. And what he kept saying is, this isn't about what we're paying my guys. It's the tracking. It's the bookkeeping. It's the, it, it's the fact that it's exactly what you're saying. Every single task is at a different pay rate. And what they're just saying is, no look, we have so many projects out there. We're not even dealing with it. It's not worth our time. And so for me, I'm really seconding this, that at a time when there are so many projects and we can't get anyone to do them and people are booking out two and three years, this is the difference on whether they're even looking at our projects or not. And from what I'm hearing from contractors, it's not impacting what people are being paid their horror of it is about the tracking and the paperwork and the smaller groups. They're just not willing to take projects that they have to deal with this. And they're really straight up with that. And it's one of the first two or three questions I get every single time. And so I want to throw that out there because I know nothing. I'm just experiencing this over and over and over and had to look it up to figure out what this was. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Steve. Yeah, I want to support the ask that you suspend the ordinance or substitute a, a an ordinance in place for now. The market is so competitive right now. There's so much work out there that we are, uh, and the costs of administering and the potential privacy leaks uh, of that kind of record keeping, uh, we're shooting ourselves, we're shooting all our toes off by doing this right now. People... I'm seeing the tradespeople being well paid right now. All of them that I talk to, everybody's well paid. So I I think it's overreach for the city to try to be enforcing minimum wages. You know, that's that's a state and a federal uh thing, and and we can't be too politically correct right now. 
Thanks, Steve. Uh, Phil Dodd. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks. I'm Phil Dodd. Um, it makes me nervous when I hear Kurt saying he's nervous. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure needs in the city. The flood has just made everything worse. I feel like we're in a crisis. I think a two year hold is reasonable. Uh, we can look at it again and perhaps uh, tweak it at that time, but uh, I would support staff on this one. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Mike. Yeah, Mike Miller, planning director. So yeah, as Lisa pointed out, we did have a meeting this morning with folks talking about building elevations and uh, the, the piece she didn't convey to you is that it will impact her and it'll impact anyone who we do building elevations for because those elevations will be between 200 and $300,000, which would potentially trip into the prevailing wage rules. So for them, their concern was, his concern was the, the actual tracking of the time that he has to hire somebody to stand there and do all the paper tracking while the projects are going on in order to demonstrate compliance with the rules. It wasn't actually that he wasn't paying the prevailing wage. Um, that was his concern was that um, it's actually paying an additional employee who wouldn't otherwise have to be there to be there to track and keep track of everything. And that that was that was their concern. And it will so it'll impact our pass through grants, which I think um Kurt had mentioned, you know, these these HMGP projects. So when we talk start talking about the building elevation projects where we're helping individual homeowners, these are the costs that that also get tagged onto those projects as well. So that's why it would affect Lisa. And I just wanted to make sure it was clear that's why it, it impacts her and others that those money are going through. So that's where the proposal to go from 200 to 300 comes from. I don't know where that came from. I just know in this in this case, I had always thought the number was 200,000. Um, and when we're talking about building elevations, we're talking about 180 to 200,000. So some of them may be below that, but in Lisa's case, it's almost certainly gonna be 200,000 in the low, probably in that lower area. It, she would be triggered in at the two hundred thousand dollar level. Okay. So if the level were increased, it would exempt that for those particular projects. But I just wanted to make sure it was clear that's why it that's why it impacted, and that's what his comment was was about paying additional employees who otherwise wouldn't need to be there. Gotcha. Thanks. So let me just add to that that <clears throat> again, in my experience, but I, I think it's probably true in this case as well. What what this leads to is by um, essentially uh, closing out the smaller, you know, family-run shops, you end up getting bids only from the larger companies who already have people on staff to track that stuff, but they they're also charging more because they've got their overhead is higher, and so you're getting bids only from the, the big the big guys and the, the small contractors who could do the work, uh, but shy away from it because they got other places they can can go because they do not have uh, the wherewithal or inclination, frankly, to to do what it takes to keep track of all this. Terry. Uh, so I, I appreciate that I don't have the direct experience that some of the folks are are saying here, but um um. If it is onerous to keep track of how much you're paying your employees and report that in, to the city, then let's figure out a way to make that less onerous. Let's figure out a way to streamline that. They they know what they're paying their employees. We don't. They don't need to hire an extra person to stand there and watch people work and count how many hours they work. So I'm just. I don't. I don't buy that. That whole. I, I don't. I don't believe it. But I do believe that there is that it's adding an extra layer of paperwork and administrative work to do all the reporting to the city. And I imagine there's a way that we could ease that. Lauren. Yeah, I was kind of thinking along the same lines. It sounds like people are really reacting to like Davis Bacon is a federal program with onerous federal tracking requirements. Like we don't need to replicate that internally. It could be like certify up front that you pay the Vermont prevailing wage, sign it. If we found out that there was a complaint, but we're not following you or requiring extensive documentation, you know, and maybe we do that for 
a, a time period and down the road, maybe we'd want to actually do some more tracking or something to make sure that it's happening. But like, I definitely don't think we should be requiring extensive paperwork. So just to that point, for, to the first point, I, I agree, like, you know, why does it cost so much? To it? But it's because every different task they do in the course of a day has a different pay rate. So you could work your first couple hours doing this, and then you go over and start flagging, and that's got a different pay rate. So someone has to document not just I worked eight hours in this; it was I worked two hours at this classification, three hours at this. So don't they have to do that so that they can get paid? Well, I think normally, I think if they were just doing it themselves, they'd just say I'm paying you fifteen bucks an hour, twenty bucks an hour to do whatever you do all day, like we do with the city. They don't track these different rates, which they have to submit for the the grant reimbursement. So, so that I think that's the complexity that we're talking about. The the basically what you're talking about is what we do now. They just sign and say, I'm doing it. So we have no audit. We have no way to be sure they're doing it. So we're just taking their word that they are. And, you know, so I think that's one of our, it's like, how, how do we know that it's actually happening, but we know that people are reacting to it. So I think that's, so it's kind of like, are, are we really getting the value that we're asking for we don't know or are they just charging more for it and keeping it as profit and, you know we don't know we have no way of knowing that and you know i get the point we don't want to pay people less it's just you know i, I i'm not sure we have no way of knowing if it's working so i'm just like a one final comment um i spent 30 years writing articles for contractors on why they should keep a time why the workers should keep a timesheet breaking down how they spend their day because it improves their ability to estimate and you know in the end it you know their bottom line and yada yada and uh, I, I didn't make that much headway in 30 years uh and and the, and these are companies who are doing uh you know two or three million dollars in total gross revenue per year as there are companies doing 50 million who are not doing this they, they don't they're just paying people so um it's just the state of the industry the other the other part is the fringe stuff which i was mentioning i mean i don't know whether lisa if your guys were even aware that there's a that that you either have to pay the wage or you have to and the benefits or you have to pay the cash value of the benefits a lot of these smaller companies have very minimal if any benefits and that's not a great thing but they don't they don't have it and so they don't they don't even bid on the work um trying to figure out <clears throat> get a handle on this question of how burdensome the reporting is um is it is this state prevailing wage rate in a document that someone could go and look at, and I assume it has a bunch of tables with flagger, prevailing wage rate is X per hour, uh, uh, steamroller driver is X per hour, all, all those things. That's correct. And so if a contractor goes is is told to go look at that table and just certify that it's it's paying its workers at a minimum in compliance with what that uh, state prevailing wage rate is. And that's, is that basically what they're doing now? That's right. That's how the ordinance is currently structured. They sign a certificate of compliance and they, there's a sign in sheet where whoever's on site that day has to sign in. Those are basically the two requirements. But like Bill said, there's no, there's no audit ability by the city or any, you know, it says they have to retain records, but there's no ability for the city to look at those records. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't seem that burdensome to me. Okay. So um, 
Tim, you look like you're about to say something. Correct me if I'm wrong. I was thinking it's, it's a motion, but we're not taking action other than to, to give a sense to the staff of how we'd like to proceed, right? Well, I think so. To be, a motion would either be let's just leave it the way it is or schedule a first reading for something else. I would it. like to move that we consider going with staff's recommendation and uh, moving it for a first reading for a two year hiatus on the rule. Second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Um, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Palin? Yes. Was that, did, I'm sorry, was that yes? Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tim? Yes. Sal. Yes. Carrie. No. Adrian. Yes. Motion carries. We'll schedule this for public hearing, but it's it sounds as though the public hearing is not or the proposal is not this package of amendments, just suspension for two years. Okay. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Kurt. Water note, I know, because we're, because we're, we're sticking with, we're on water now. Water <clears throat> notification policy. Uh, yes, so um, there, are, we've had Thanks, a fair folks. number of, uh, fair number of water breaks um, this year, as we do most years. And there's been, um, you know, a lot of discussion about how we notify residents um, when there is a water break. And there's um, there's a lot of different scenarios. There's cases where we need to do a boil water notice. There's cases when we don't. Sometimes there's road closures. Sometimes a very large area is impacted. Sometimes it's a very small area. Um, so uh, I hand drew up um, what I thought would be kind of a, a good method to deal with this. And then Evelyn polished it and made it look really nice, which I appreciate. <laughs> it does. Um, so, uh, in your packets, there's, there's a flow chart basically of how we, how we handle, um, notices when we have water breaks. Um, so we had a water break, is there boil water? Uh, yes or no. If it's no, then, um, then we're just doing a localized VT alert, which is just the area that's impacted, uh, for those residents that are, um, that are going to lose water likely. And then uh, we put it on Notify Me, which anybody can sign up for. So people that want to get all the notices have the ability to do that through the Notify Me process, which is on the website. And then from there, we look at road closure. If it's not, um, then we'll just kind of end it there. If it is, then we're going to do a citywide um, BT alert um, so that, and, you know, traveling public knows that the road's closed so we can fix the leak. So that's the that's the no side of the boil water notice. And if there is a boil water um and then we make the distinction of how large an area is impacted by the break. So if it's a if it's a huge part of the city, um, even on School Street when we had a construction shutdown, um, we had uh, almost 250 notices to put out between 5 a.m. and and 8 a.m. and it was challenging. We considered that not big enough not to do hand notices, but. We ran out of time to get all the hand delivered notices out because it was so big. So there are areas that are a little gray, um, and so it's not going to be a hundred percent perfect. Um, and and what we really want to do is encourage people to sign up for these electronic notices because, you know, the the days of hand delivered paper notices at some point has to come to an end. It's it's really burdensome on our staff. Uh, it you know it takes hours to do these notices, um, and you know, we're printing tons and tons of paper to to hand out for a one-time use. So, uh, what we've talked about recently is trying to um, try to set a timeline, a goal, and and like, you know, a year and a half. Can we can we start a messaging campaign to residents to say, this is how we're going to notify electronically. You have to sign up for these things and give them a year and a half to do that. But we can we can um, go down and talk about that later potentially, or we can staff can develop a plan for that. Um, 
So the distinction between how big the, the shutdown is, if it's a very large area, um, hand-delivered notices are just not feasible. So we do a citywide VT alert. We get it out on a press release. We do radio ads. Uh, we put it on our website, and we do on the notify me. Um, if it's not a small area, then we're, for now, doing hand-delivered notices, a localized VT alert, which is just the areas impacted, notify me on the website. So that's so we'd like council to sort of approve this plan tonight, and then we will advertise it and um, and really encourage folks to sign up for the electronic notification. And so, Kurt, one of the things that uh, that I think about, I, I think this is a good uh, good approach to this. Uh, one of the things I think about is um, we had a comment from someone who said, "Yeah, I don't live in the affected area, but." That's where I take my kid to daycare. And so I didn't get a notification, drove the, drove to the daycare center, and that's how I found out. Um, yeah. So in that case, if they were on Notify Me, they would they would get the notice. The, the concern with using VT alerts for everything is that people start like, numbing to it. If you overuse it, people stop reading them. And so I'd really trying to avoid putting a VT alert out every time there's a break anywhere that just affects a small area. I think it it works counter to um, the effectiveness of the notice. Mm -hmm. But if you sign up and notify me, anything we put out for DBW, you can get from any. You know. So mm -hmm. that's one way to get anything from anywhere in the city. Adrian, I'm thinking like old school, back in the olden days, you know, like the telephone tree. <laughs> Remember that? I don't know, but like human contact and. We know in our neighborhood, we have a very strong community network and we all know each other. So we can go knock on people's doors and, you know, some folks don't, you know, have computers or smartphones, like that doesn't exist still. So I know those people, like if I were alerted, I'd go tell them that the, you know, the water's off, but I think there could be potentially to consider like a, another level below of grassroots community canvassing. Um, so that the city is not ultimately responsible for printing papers and going door by door, because that's clearly not sustainable. But we have great people in our community that could be like a champion or like a something for, you know, that community to help spread the word. I don't know what that would look like. I know we've kind of had that structure in the past. We've maintained it in our community. Some communities haven't, but it's something to, to think about. Just yes, and and like you said, it's intermittent. It's different in different places. But I just want to be clear: if if you have a landline phone, you can get called by VT alert. You don't mm -hmm. need. It, it, you can sign up for phone calls or texts or uh, email oh, or all three. Like clear instructions because I don't. I don't think I even knew that. <laughs> well, but, and so that's good to know, right? right. So what I'm telling my neighbors, like, hey, if you got your landline, like, let's set you up. Um, I didn't know that honestly. Well, you just put in a phone number. It calls a phone. Yeah, I. So. I mean, I know you've done an excellent job with your tutorials, and um, thank you for that. I try to spread it as far and wide as I possibly can, and it's good to have these systems. Um, but it's also good to monitor the systems to figure out where you are now in terms of your coverage for alerts, and then identify those gaps because there might be whole neighborhoods that never signed up. And so who, where are those gaps and how do you then have that like very targeted approach to say, hey, here's a note, you know, whatever it is, like a campaign to get those numbers up. But you need to know where you are now, where those gaps are and be very strategic on how to fill them so that you can get people signed up. So that could be a strategy. And the other, the other piece I think to consider when you talk about using neighborhood volunteers is that sometimes these breaks are at two or three in the morning and they're trying to get people notified too. So it's just, you know, they're not, it's one thing when you have a scheduled break, you know, we, we talked today about maybe, you know, supplementing with police and fire folks, if they're available, if they're not already on other calls, you know, if they can help, but it is not a great use of city resources to have people, mm -hmm. putting, you know, and you know, we've had cases where people have put stuff out in the middle of the night and someone gets up in the morning so I didn't get a notice because they haven't gone out yet and it's hanging on their door. So I, there's, there is no perfect system, but we, we, we wanted you to see what we're trying to do and get your feedback. So. Lauren. 
Yeah. I mean, I think this is a great, great model and agree. Like, I mean, it sounds like the goal of getting everyone on notify me seems like a great <laughs> goal, like as much as we possibly can. I'm wondering about the, um, the maple, the Montpelier action plan, like, could there be like a test run or a way to plug that crew in part of which is like community engagement in how are we notifying people for emergencies? This is like a small scale localized emergency, but can we get that like network of uh, people maybe take something off your plate, be like, can you guys do a campaign or something that could be like a public education campaign? So, I mean, I'm happy to bring that to the commission and see if there could be a way to like build a you know, maybe it's like a little pilot project of that to to get going. But then once people are signed up for this, then that's helpful for all future things. So they might be able to be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I think this looks great. Good flow chart. I think it looks really good. You should do that. And <laughs> um, I didn't, I don't think I, I knew that Notify Me worked with landlines. I thought it was just I don't text. think Notify Me does. Well, then... VT did alert you just does. Say it did? Okay. I said VT alert does because they make a phone call. Notify me is only like an email, but notify me is the citywide one. I know. Yeah. So, so if I'm trying to get the of the DPW alerts, and but you don't want to send out all of them on VT alert because you don't want to be right. Then, then the only way to get them is notify me. But if I don't have a cell phone or email, I can't get that. That's, so I, I I don't. I, that's correct. Okay. Great. So, um, sorry, I'm sounding, I'm sounding cranky and impatient. I still haven't been through because <laughs> <laughs> I know you all are working super hard and you're doing great. Um, on St. Paul Street <laughs> yesterday, we had no water and I signed up for all the things. And so I got all the notification the night before. Great. Um, and, um, and I knew that the, the, procedure was to put notices on people's doors because then I thought about my neighbor who I'm 100% sure has no internet or right. texting and then my other neighbor here I'm sure he doesn't and then the people over there who I don't really know them that well but I kind of suspect that they're not hooked in either and um but they're okay because you put the notices on the doors but you didn't put the notices on the doors and I understand how it happened and it's you know it happens and it's fine and then the next day they went out and everything but that but that we there, there are times when we we have to let people know. We we can't say. I mean, there were you know old people with no resources and no connection who are just sitting in their house wondering what happened to the water. Is it coming back on? Is it not coming back on? I got a sink full of dishes. I, don't, I mean, this is what my neighbors told me when I started going out and like knocking on doors because I realized that I didn't have anything on my door, so that my neighbors must not have either. Uh, so let's just let's just not forget that. Let's just keep that in mind. And yes, no system is perfect and we're never going to get everybody. But if we could change notify me so it it would call landlines or if we had some way that people could sign up to get called on their landline, that would be great. So VT alert does call. You can sign up for a call or a, a text or an email or all three. So what we're saying is if there's a localized area. So if we can we can actually draw a grid around an area and it will call all the numbers Great. in that area. So under that scenario, the landline person would have got a phone call. Notify me just is a general, we put all kinds of stuff in notify me. All, you know, this is what's coming next week. It's for people that want to know everything that's going on with DPW, including emergency announcements. And that is only an email thing. So that's different. That is not that that's a supplemental alert. VT alert is the emergency alert. And that's the, the one. That, so if somebody has to sign up for one thing, I'd tell them sign up for VT right. alert. Okay. Because that's the one we're going to use. That's, you'll see that's there at the beginning of everything. Um, and it's only a question of how wide we do the VT alert. So, okay. So I'm at the uh, MontpelierVermont.org slash list site. And there's like a bazillion things you can sign up for. The yes. one we want is newsflash public works is that right dpw news we should say that here and we should i think say how you can get it you know you can get it 
via email. In other words, without they're having to figure that out from the site right here, where we're giving them the URL, say email, cell phone, text, landline, if if that applies, just so they don't have to find it. But okay. uh, yeah. And the other thing we're gonna we talked about doing today is, um, which I don't know why we hadn't thought of it earlier, but is when we do the while we're still doing notices is put on the notice. You know, you should sign up for these. Mm -hmm. so that they get the handwritten notice and then particularly if we end up setting a, a discontinuance date like you know january by january 1 2026 we're going to no longer do this or you know so you have 15 months to sign up for these options i i think this is all very good i i i'm clear that there are some people that, that are just not going to get this and it's going to be mostly Poor people, people who may not uh, speak English, um, people who are already in uh, at the bottom of a lot of other things, but but I don't know that there's a way around that. We we need to just keep making our government as responsive as it can possibly be. Steve, yeah. the only way I can see this working equitably is in combination with the community, the, the neighborhood associations, because I know a number of people who don't have email or text or phone even or landline and, 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 and don't want to subscribe to those things. So we, we can't just leave them. And, and then when you mention it's the poor who might not have the phones, they're the ones who can least afford to get intestinal troubles from drinking bad water so we we need to make sure we leave no one behind with this notification structure even if it means that a uh, agent in each neighborhood knows exactly which six addresses they have to deliver these to well i although i will say and this is uh kind of a surprising experience to me when i we I've spent my entire career in as a legal aid lawyer, and back when I started, back in 1979 and into the early 80s, um, tremendous share of the clients I represented didn't have a phone. Period. And the way we contacted them was we would they would give us their mother's phone number or their next door neighbor's phone number or something, and I would have to call and leave a message and hope they would call back. Now, almost all of my clients have phones, and whether they whether they answer them, whether they uh, <clears throat> set up their voicemail, all of those things are uh, are big ifs. But almost all of them have phones now. I also forgot to mention that to see all the kids show up for story time at the library and be turned away was heartbreaking. And there's no way that your alert system could have avoided that. That was yesterday. So do you, do you want to vote or do you think, I think you, what you're hearing is people are pretty satisfied with this. Yeah, no, nope, that's fine. Just okay. approval to publicize this as our, as our method would be great. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Um, city council reports. Adrian, you want to start with you? Sure, and I think mine will probably be in tandem with Sal's, but I'll get it started. One of our, one of mine. Um, Sal and I kick it to him. I will kick it to him because <laughs> he has something to share. <laughs> I forgot mine at home. Darn it, it's on my table. Anyway, so Sal and I attended. Um, we were invited to participate in the All Brains Belong Community Health Fair on Saturday. Was it Saturday or Sunday? Uh, Saturday. It was Saturday. Um, at the State House, and I am very involved in All Brains Belong. It's a great organization. Um, they've helped my daughter in many ways. She's on the spectrum and supported her through her journey. And we were able to um, work with and meet with an autistic child that communicates through, um, I don't know, it's like a, a, letter, card. a letter card. Point. Letter okay. points at the letter card and did a, a rap song on how he can, how, what he feels. That's how he communicates. And so we had the honor of meeting him and his family, learning about his journey, 
And um, Sal really did most of the work. Um, he presented the family with the key to the city. And um, it was just a really magical moment. And they gave us some beautiful artwork from the young um, gentleman. I think he was nine, nine, nine years old. So um, I'll let Sal share the, the pictures, but it was, yeah, so, it was great. Uh, we got these um, pieces of art. So there's a, a pieces of art also done by a neurodiverse, young yep. neurodiverse artist. Yep. And this is uh, Hassan Ahmed's message. They, they together, these two are, they're paid podcasters for this organization called <laughs> Kind Theory. And they, um, they invented this podcast called Give Us a Minute. And this is what Hassan put, he wrote on here. And I asked his mother, I said, you know, how did he come up with this phrase? He's nine years old. And he, you know, this is his, he made, this is his statement. No coaching, pointing out all the letters. The difference between your mind and mine may be perceived as a gap but your decisions can build bridges. The kid is nine years old. He's amazing. Um, let me just, if I can, I'm not gonna read the whole letter, but one paragraph. Two of our youngest neurodivergent contributors, Ashvita Kunder and Hassan Ahmed, have been inspired by our mission to start the project, Give Us a Minute. They have gifted you and others this art piece to help remind people in positions of change making to consider neurodivergent experiences and needs in their decisions. One in five people will benefit directly from neurodivergent affirming policies, and we all benefit from more inclusive communities. There, these people are pictured on the back of these. So, if we could find a place for these, absolutely. Um, I have one too. I just I forgot think it. Would be great. I can bring it in. It was, uh, it, was, too. it was just a wonderful experience to meet this, this kid who, um, and they really only discovered that he could do this in the last 18 months or so. They thought he was not listening or he didn't have the intellect. Mm -hmm. And then he started pointing and they said, how did you learn all this? And he, he, he had taught himself to read, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, it was it was a couple of hours worth worth spend, spending there. Cherish. <laughs> Palin. Lauren. Okay. Uh, mayor's report. I have a couple of items. One, uh, many of us saw as we were uh, getting ready for our, our meeting uh this evening an email that just came down came out saying that um in the uh there's being there's a transition at good samaritan haven and uh julie bond is becoming uh the sole uh, executive director and rick DeAngelis is uh moving to uh, an advisory role and uh I just want to express my appreciation uh, for for Rick, who's uh, spent a career working uh, and advocating for affordable housing uh, for for really people who uh, who who need it the most, and uh, and he's been a great. Uh, asset and benefit to the community and so i appreciate all the work that rick has done over the years and also my appreciation for julie for stepping up to do this because with everything they have done it is uh it's a huge job and so thank you to the organization and to both of them for doing this um Second, this afternoon, I was I had the opportunity to be at a at a ribbon cutting at uh, John and Liz Snell's house for to celebrate their uh, conversion to uh, heat pumps for uh, 
significant part of their heat and it was demonstrating how the uh, funding made available through the in Inflation Reduction Act and uh, in a Efficiency Vermont have made it possible to have a tremendous impact on their energy use and um, a step towards our goal of being net zero city and uh, and so it's it's the kind of thing that the only way we get there is not only by what we're doing here in the city, but also by what uh, volunteers and homeowners all across the city are doing to uh, to save energy and reduce our climate impact. And as I was sitting there at the standing there at the uh, ribbon cutting, I I was thinking, well, wait a minute. My wife and I just put in a couple of fireplace inserts, and that was part of the uh, part of the thing too. So, uh, so there's something we we can all do. And and finally, the last thing I've been working on, trying to figure out what is going on with our post office. And I can tell you that it is not easy to find out. It is not easy to uh, find out who you need to talk to to get the information. And when I finally <laughs> reach the person who uh, should have the information, and I, I said to him, "Well, when's the? Uh, what's the timeline now?" And he told me that's above my pay grade. And I said, "Well, okay. Well, what?" is the name and phone number of the person above your pay grade that can tell me that information. And that was met with silence. Um, so I know that work is going on in the building and I asked him to let me know the next time he's gonna be here to, uh, to be touring the site. Let me know so I can go through it with you and see what, what's going on. But work is going on, but the only, thing they could tell me about uh, due dates is that all the dates they have established are in the past. So, <laughs> so there we are. That's life in our capital city. And that's what I've got, city clerk's report. Just wanna remind anybody listening that this coming, the general election, uh, folks are automatically getting sent mailed a ballot uh, by the Secretary of State. Everybody gets one. I had a lot of folks asking about uh, early voting, and I get to assure them that, ask or not, you're going to get one. Um, so just, you know, just for you, all of that comes up, too. And, John, is this something where people are going to get the entire ballot? They're not going to get, like, some of it comes in the mail and some of it you have to request? The way it was for the primary. Decision. No, this is all one, okay. one, one single ballot. It's a nice, easy election this time. Good. Board of abatement. Yes, we do. Board of abatement tomorrow. Be there. Six thirty, senior center. Bill, uh, just got a couple things. Um, I guess first, this is our first meeting um, that we've had to just recognize the life and service of Senator Bill Doyle, who passed away. Uh, that's why our local municipal flag has been at half mast for order of the mayor. Um, you know, I, I I hope heaven can keep up with all the meals that Bill's at at the same time. Um, he, he was a, a giant at being at every event you could possibly be at, but uh, he certainly served our region for a long time honorably and uh, passed away at 98, so good for him, life well lived. Um, since we had our last uh, special meeting, which turned into a, a more full meeting, we certainly have continued to struggle with uh, issues with homelessness. We continue to work, you know, basically you affirmed that we, we continue working on our policy. We are trying to work with folks. Uh, and, you know, we have had more people coming uh, and more disruptive actions, so we're trying to focus on those. We've had some arrests up there for, for disorderly conduct and assault and a few other things. We did have to remove a, a, a trailer out of there. So we're trying to still trying to figure out the best option. We actually met with the state's attorney today. Not that we want to start arresting people, but we wanted to make sure we understood what 
what the options were, particularly for people that were more difficult than others, uh, and and how we could how we could work on that situation. We went up and viewed the site, um, and I'd actually uh, called through the VLCT, which I happen to be president of. I've called a meeting of several communities who are dealing with this. We're going to try to arrange a meeting for next week just to share, you know, what we're all doing and what resources we have, and see if we can all get on the same page as far as what works and what doesn't work, and, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so we are definitely, you know, it's probably, you know, not, it's nothing to joke about, but we say, you know, it's like, we're basically just doing homelessness and flooding these days. And that's about it. It feels like everything else is, you know, <laughs> when we're not free, even, you know, DPW gets it. So it's definitely on our mind. So that's happening. And as things happen, we will keep you well informed, but it's a, it's a tough issue for all involved. You know, as I, I like to tell people and remind people, um, you know, there's no, right. The, the state doesn't allow people on their property. There's no cities that are allowing people on their public property. Private people aren't allowing their public. There's, you know, no place for someone to legally be. So we have to think about this with a heart while we're trying to figure out where to, where to move them. But, you know, we, the city, you know, we don't know where they all are, but but that's where we're working with our partners to figure that out. And so that's where we're at. That's all I got. So it is 1048, just a final note. I appreciate this is one of those meetings where we had a couple of issue, difficult issues with strong feelings on all sides. And I appreciate the, uh, the way that people were able to discuss every, everything that came before us. And with that, at 1048, we are in it. We are adjourned. <laughs>